Okay, well, I think we will, um, I'll just fade my screen up. There we go. You can see me now. Great. Okay. Um, well, it's 10, 1030. Um, I think what we'll do is, um, we'll, we'll, uh, should we just waiting for Rich, Richard Reeser is, uh, the, um, other member of our workshop today who's going to be joining us. So he, I'm sure he'll be joining us very shortly. Um, but I just wanted to, um, introduce the the talk. So let me just, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit and explain a few things, just to get us started, just 10 minutes, just to show you what we're doing here. So hopefully my screen is now spotlighted for all of you to see. Um, so here we are. Uh, this is uh, the um, uh, our first telepresence uh, stage knowledge exchange workshop with, with Cryptic Arts. And we're joined by Jamie Hale and Caitlin Griffiths from, from uh, Cryptic Arts today. And um, what we've got, what I've got set up here, we, we, I'm putting the mix into the, into, into the um, system. I'm actually taking all your feeds out of out of Teams into here, and as you can see, I've got all your all the slides presented up on on screen behind me. So I'm actually in, uh, well, not actually in. I say I'm I'm pres tele presently in the um, the uh, Camden People's Theatre uh, rehearsal room. Uh, that's where I am. Uh, Jamie might recognise it. Um, and um, so let's get make a start. Um, I just I want to do a sort of a sort of welcome uh, introduction of the program and that sort of thing. Just give you a little bit of an update um, on things and then show you the program. Show you what we're doing. Sorry today. to interrupt, Paul. Yep. Uh, do you want to record it? Um, if that's okay, we can record on Teams as well. That'd be fantastic if, if everyone's happy with that. I think we all are. <laughs> Okay. Okay, starting recording. Wonderful. Okay, lovely. So what we've got is um uh this is we're just doing a brief introduction to get us started. So what I wanted to do um is uh show you uh the the program for today. So we're gonna we're gonna start um at ten forty with, with Steve, who's gonna do a presentation for fifteen minutes. Um and then I'll do a quick sort of uh chair some questions and uh, a short response and then i'll be doing a talk myself and we'll have a break um and then we'll have a talk uh, a brief presentation from trish wheatley and um, and then followed by Mark, uh, richard reza uh and then another break and and so on and then we're going to have uh jamie's going to be talking and i'll be then responding with another talk and then we have a, a, a lunch we'll come back after lunch to have our kind of plenary discussion and i'll be inviting you up here to to talk um and discuss and I'll, i can bring you all up on screen um i can show you that all, already just to give you a little bit of a of a idea of what we're going to be how you can be present in this room everybody uh let's just have a quick put you all on here here we are you're all all of you who are here today um are currently there is everyone there I'm not sure I've got, oh, maybe I haven't got Siobhan in there, actually. But let me just put Siobhan in as well on one second. And I'll just adjust that. Um, I'm not sure Siobhan will stay with us for the whole, meet, whole meeting as, as our project manager. He's managing a number of projects yes. as well. <laughs> but I'll put you in, Siobhan, if that's all right. To bring you in there. Yeah, thank you. There we are. There we go. And um, aha, who else have we got joining us now? Richard's coming. Okay, fantastic. You can, you can let Richard in. Fantastic. And Richard is already there already, as you can see, because Richard was, was here yesterday. So I managed to get Richard in on his green screen into the space. So you're going to be appearing here, and I'll be bringing you down to the table at points as well to make to, to make this these presentations and that sort of thing. Um, and um, so let's just go back to my presentation, and uh, we'll carry on with with the uh, with the slides. So that's that's our pre that's our program for today. It is. I want to make it as productive as as, as we possibly can. We're, we're we're a small group. We're recording this um, for us to refer to and for others to actually refer to as well. So it is a resource that we're creating today today as well. So yes. do see it that way. Um, this is actually what I'm doing, and I know I don't want to sort of um, over technically <laughs> give a, too much of an over technical description of what we're doing today it was very much about content generation but just so you know i've asked you all to come in on these green screens into teams and i have the have the capability 
to take each of your individual streams out of Teams, your full video image, and bring it into the video mix here into into um, into VMix, and then I can stream that back into VMix, and we'll talk more about that later on. Um, but that's exact. That, that's actually what I'm doing today. Um, so, and I wanted just to give a quick reminder of our our timetable. Um, the only you have seen this, everyone's seen this. The only slight adjustment will be is that we're going to um, the Cryptic Arts residency is going to extend by by a month uh, into June. We were going to initially going to end it in May, but it's looking likely that there might be another production opportunity that's more suitable for the workshop um, that will happen in June rather than May. And we can, we can Jamie and I, of course, will discuss that in more detail later. But we'll keep you updated. But that's the only change to the program. And as you can see, here we are, the Cryptic Arts Workshop, the first box in blue on the top left corner. That's where we are today, um, sort of January, February time, just at the end of January, beginning of February. Uh, and that's that's the uh, that's an update on where we are. So with um, what a little bit ahead of myself, I just wanted to say one other quick thing was before we hand over to 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 Steve. Um, I was going to do, sort of, we have done some round table introductions and I know we haven't for the benefit of, of Jamie, but what, what I was going to suggest was rather than do that um, now, um, we can do that as as we do the the um, the workshop, as we do the presentations. Is that, is that okay with everybody? Can we do little introductions to ourselves when we, when we give our, our, our presentations? Okay. In that case. Uh, um. Paul. Yes. Hello, Siobhan. If I just might just introduce myself and then I probably will leave you to your workshop just of so course. everybody knows. Of course. Um, that I, I'm the project manager. I'm supporting um, uh, Paul. Um, I support on uh, liaising with all of you um, when contracts are in question and hopefully you should all have those or have signed those. Do let me know if you have any queries. Um, and also, um, I'm in charge of uh, managing the budget um, with Paul, obviously, and um, that's probably the main inputs um, and just just seeing everything um, goes smoothly if, where I can. So um, I, I'd just like to wish you good luck with, for today. And it's been amazing to see the, the whole um, how it works so i'm really excited for you all and i'll just leave you thank you very much great fantastic okay thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. thank you siobhan um what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll that's that's really helpful thank you um so what we'll do now is we'll start with the with with we'll get on to our first presentation from from steve so i can um steve is actually going to share his screen and make the presentation I want to make sure that I can I can see your presentation, Steve, on my screen. So I'm just going to um, fade you onto my screen so I can record you. Um, but I'm going to hand over to you to um, to uh, for your presentation. Fantastic. Uh, good to see you all. Um, oh, hang on. What's oh, that? That, that was That's me. not that, the presentation. That was that was me. Okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'll do I'll do that in a minute. When you share, share I'll do that. <laughs> I'll share the screen in a moment. Okay. Um, that's not the opening slide. Um, but yeah, just to introduce my, uh, me a little, I'm uh, I'm Steve Dixon. I'm president of uh, an arts college uh, in in Asia, La Salle College of the Arts in Singapore. Um, so it's a bit it's six thirty p.m. here, um, and uh, I have a, ba a background in theatre as a theatre director and uh, and performer, working in various multimedia uh, stage shows. But also um, a lot of sh um, shows on the in on the internet and using virtual reality, and I will sh show some of those as part of my my presentation. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to offer a very brief. I will now share and hope it all works. Is that good? Yep, that's good. OK, so I'm going to offer a very brief history. I've only got 15 minutes of online and networked performances, uh, and this includes some of my own work. Uh, some of this draws on my book on the history uh, of the use of technologies in the performing arts. I'm going to be begin with this pre-internet piece by art science pioneer Billy Kluver. He asked all these questions, and they're quite interesting questions, about what the world would be like 10 years later in 1981 to a networked audience. 
He connected telex machines between four different cities in different countries. He then asked both experts and the general public these questions, and they gave their often very culturally specific responses. In 1977, Douglas Davis presented a live satellite telecast to 25 different countries. A really art uh, piece included performances by Joseph Boyce, Namjoon Pike and Charlotte Mormon. But the most celebrated example of pre-internet telematic performance, and this is what we're working with, basically telematic means connecting remote locations together, was Hole in Space. It used a live video satellite um, to connect the Broadway department store in Los Angeles and the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts in New York. Now, large screens in the two spaces enabled passers-by to hear, see and communicate with one another. It was quite a sensation at the time and the satellite was very expensive. It was sat, um, sponsored by NASA. From the early 1990s, theater groups also began to use telematics using quite elementary video conferencing software, particularly um, CUCME, which was the first sort of widespread one. The Gertrude Stein Repertory Theater were among the most important pioneers. The George Coates performance works were also uh, uh, very important in the development of these, these technologies and the first to use live video conferencing in a stage performance. The Nowhere Band tells the story of four musicians who get together online and this was really early internet days. They played live from their four different countries. One was a bagpipe uh, player and there was a saxophonist and various things uh, and they were projected in windows on a stage screen uh, in the live theatre st uh, staging using high speed um, T1 internet connection. However, because of the different time lags between the four locations and because the internet was so slow and laggy at the time, um, the, their audio was channeled into the theatre by a muscle, much less glamorous technology, their telephones. Um, so it was the only way that everyone, all the musicians could actually play in sync in those days. The field of webcam performance was opened by Jennifer Ringley, who was the first celebrity formed by the internet. She had over 20 million viewers a day. The newly established World Wide Web then suddenly constituted the largest theatre in the world, offering everyone 15 megabytes of fame. In 1966, cyborg performance artist Stellark, both metaphorically and physically, gave his body to the internet. In his quest to converge humans and machines, he attached electrodes all over his body. Internet audience members then stimulated different parts of his body with electric shocks. So all the movements you see here are actually involuntary. They're prompted by the audience um, clicking uh, a virtual body online, which stimulates uh, his different muscles. So Stellark takes the dehumanization and machinization of the body to extremes. His body is reduced to little more than an empty shell, a human cadaver to be jerked like a puppet in a macabre human computer game. But in later uh, performances such as Exoskeleton, he is firmly in control of the technology and celebrates the power of the metallically enhanced body. He's a very interesting artist. So Stellark plays both the supplicant and the visionary warrior in relation to technology's potential effects on the body. A performer using similar strategies around the same time was Marcelian Tunes Roca, a Spanish artist. Now in Epizu, we see Roca controlled by technology and by his audience who use touchscreen computers, you see at the bottom there, to activate robotic manipulations of his body. Pneumatic metal molds and hooks pump up and down comically and grotesquely. Like in Stellark's example, it presents a vision of the cyborg as a dehumanized body. It also illustrates how humans can use technology to electronically torture others at a distance. But in this later one-man show, uh, Roker is the one in control. He dances with industrial robots and his gestures and movements control all the video and animated screen sequences using body sensors attached to an offstage computer. So he, he's generating all these images. The story is based on Homer's The Odyssey and Roker's gestures activate the rich imagery that create the effect of Ulysses' journey. Here his gestures prompt planets to ascend and descend. 
in the year 2000, my theatre company, the Chameleons Group, uh, created one of the most ambitious interactive internet performances of its time. I'm not saying it was a good show, and it wasn't particularly, but it, it was quite important in, um, in its innovation. On the web audience's computer monitors, a video window of the performance was combined with a text chat room. A three camera outside, outside broadcast unit relayed everything on the internet live. We performed in an empty theatre on three stages. This is me 20 years ago uh, as the MC. The audience was invited to write the performance by typing in suggestions which the performers used and improvised with spontaneously. Here someone told her to scream, see that on the text. As we performed, we kept an eye on screens around the stage space, relaying the scrolling text from the chat room. In one sequence, we asked the audience to type in lines of dialogue and the performers spoke them aloud as soon as they appeared. It included dialogue written intentionally for the performers, but also incidental chat going on at the time between audience members. Although internet audiences love this type of interactive theatre because they help to create it, I note that for us as the actors, the experience was not so pleasant. The normal theatre hierarchy privileging the actors over the audience is actually reversed as the audience takes control. And internet audiences are often cruel and very rude. As we'll see from this sequence, where we ask the audience uh, to suggest characters for us to play and actions to do. <laughs> This was the world's stupidest man. This, that suggestion was being sick. Jack Derrida, is that one? Someone in the audience typed a rabbit and we all started to perform rabbits. More rabbits they asked for and we went with it. This is drinking piss. Coming up is Adolf Hitler and Hamlet is a junkie. Okay, so that was quite, you know, an interesting uh, ex experiment and we'd learnt a lot from it. Um, and sort of leading on from that, uh, 11 years later, um, I did another interactive uh, online piece. Now, the pleasure of audience agency is now seen as a really key element in online uh, performance. 12 years ago, I created this experimental internet soap opera with theatre students at Brunel University in London and Rick Mayle, uh, the actor and comedian. It's user controlled with online audience, uh, the online audience actually writing the episodes and creating different stories or what we call lands. They, set, they sent in their ideas as well as pieces of music and performance. The editors then picked and incorporated the best scenes and ideas. It's a black comedy using multiple genres. It's a real kind of mashup um, because it, like, all these different ideas come in. We often stop scenes uh, at midpoint to ask the online audience what happens next, and then they write in and we, we, we work with their suggestions. So let's have a look, some clips. Mr. Richard. Soapopolis is just another day in the 23rd dimension. Would you like to be in it? Then send something in. Your 
the one to be. You fall off the stage. I like you. I really like you. That's gonna work. Porno land. Shall I take it off? And I've just bought vanity land. <laughs> I'll tell you what I think. What does he think? What's Jimmy going to do? What do you want him to do? <laughs> Don't be afraid. Not yet. We're not dead. We're on television. This is a whole new form of entertainment. In this place, you are gone. It's your soap operas. Okay, the final interactive uh, piece I'm going to show is an interactive virtual reality theatre piece that Paul and I uh, worked on together, and it's from 2019. Uh, the, the picture in the back actually is, is the campus of my arts college, which is quite spectacular. Um, so two live actors meet a single audience member live through a virtual reality headset. So it's very personal and very intense. The clips from the show that you'll see are the full wraparound image, image. Uh, so 360, wearing um, a VR headset, you'd have to turn completely around to see all that you're seeing now. My name's Hugonimus Tosh, and I just know we're going to get along. It seems like paradise, but actually it's just an arts college. So it's a live performance for one audience member at a time who wears a VR headset. We get to know them by name and we interact and engage them in lots of different improvisations. Some of these are silly, some are serious. The virtual backgrounds keep changing as we take them on a journey that it leads eventually to a dark place. It's a 10 minute performance in all. Everything is very immersive and close up. It's also all in 3D, which you don't fully get from this video. But hang on. Okay, sorry. That, thanks, Global Protect, for that. Okay, hang on. Jean Paul Sartre's No Exit. It's about three people who are stuck in this very hot room together forever. And the twist is that they are actually in hell. <laughs> So um, the system we're using connects two separate spaces with green screen backgrounds. The audience participant is in one space, the two actors are in the other. That's interactivity, isn't it? Everything is so vivid. There are 360 degree cameras in both spaces. Their images are conjoined and composited with virtual backgrounds. You will be the third character. Because your life held in other people! At the end of the show, we break the fourth wall to come into the room of the audience member and hold their hands. This normally absolutely terrifies them. Okay, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. If, if you stop sharing your screen now, is that right? I have, yeah. You have, fantastic. All right, let me just bring you up here. There we go. Am I spotlighted? I think I'm spotlighted again, yeah? Yeah. Good, good, good. I'm trying to sort of make a kind of visual reference to talking to you now. Um, great. Well, thanks, Steve. Brilliant, brilliant. What what we got, we wanted to have a few, just five minutes, and that you're absolutely on time, so that's great. So we're going to have five minutes just to have some sort of uh, some questions. And respond and a little bit of response um, led by myself. Um, so I, I'm happy to take any questions. If anyone wants to pipe up uh, with with uh, questions they may have for Steve about his presentation, any element at all. Well, let me start then. Oh, Richard, yeah, go ahead. 
Is Richard on mute? Yep. You, you're muted. Yeah, Pat. yeah, yeah. I noticed that you introduced the editor in the in 2011 because of the anarchic responses from the audience. You said cruel and rude. Do you think that that's actually necessary because of the nature of the way people working remotely on the Internet, as we've seen, say all their worst thoughts and uh, it let, tends to extremism? Do you think it's necessary to have an editor in this situation? Um, I'm, uh, OK, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very sort of um, free spirited libertarian anarchist yeah. uh, in some ways. Don't, don't tell my, my colleagues that. But uh, so I don't sort of I, I, I don't tend to, 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 to say that particularly. Of course, you know, if you get into, uh, you know, hate, you know, hate, sort of hate the hate of, of the Internet. One wants to sort of to temper that that or whatever. But in terms of editing, censoring or um, or whatever. I don't, you know, I, I personally don't have a, a a big thing about it. And actually, a lot of it can be uh, quite 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 fun and funny as well. If it's just um, sort of taking the Mickey and and it's comically comically done, which it, it was in that show. It's just kind of uncomfortable when you're trying to trying to trying to deal with it. Um, you know, kind of moment by moment as an improvisational actor. Well, my point really was that because the general attitude to and we're talking disability in this project yeah. general attitude to disability is is ignorance and uh, the wrong wrong headedness it's likely that in my view that we probably do if we were to do it that sort of situation that you would need someone to moderate it because otherwise you could get really terrible stuff being done <clears throat> no i yeah, absolutely and i i, I think it's kind of um, it's up to who, who, who it's your project <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and it's up to you how, how, be, how best to manage it. And, you know, I'm sure Paul and I certainly absolutely, absolutely go with that. I was just talking from a, from a sort of yeah. personal, personal, personal viewpoint. But it, no, I, I appreciate what, you, what you're saying and it's absolutely justified. Totally. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. I think the point in a way, the, the point is, I think you as performers, dealt with it very well it might have appeared awkward mm. but but you dealt with it it was actually but actually i think, I think the, the difficult and contentious part is or the bit that needs editing is what is revealed by the public to others i think maybe as well because your your mm. in a sense your performance is your own editing of it you, you can choose not yeah, to yeah. do it or deal with it respond to it in a way that is appropriate um but but you can't uh, yeah, I mean, you can't stop people writing what they want to write sorry steve go ahead no, I was just going to say, actually, we sort of rehearsed and were very ready for those kind of uh, rude, you know, uh, um, or obscene, you know, yeah. people say, oh, sc screw each other and, and, and all, all those things. And we actually sort of um, agreed that, you know, we wouldn't just sort of ignore, you, you sort of confront it and sort of uh, and, and work with it, but try to sub but try to subvert it where you can or be clever or, fu or funny with it rather than taking it, particularly when it's a sort of nasty thing. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. I'm mean, really interesting because, in a way, you are the mediator of what of that channel of, mm. of information of what comes through and what is relayed to the public. You know, you you're working in a sense of a kind of um, there's an input and there's an output, and you've got to make the decisions about what what it is that go that, that you're going to allow in and what it is that's going to going to go out. I guess. Um, Steve, you've I mean you've worked with you worked on the first on the first project the telepresence stage project um and we had we had we worked with 10 different theater companies um and some of those did involve audience participation um i wonder if you just generally just give me a little bit of your your some perhaps some highlights from from, from that research from the first project that you think um are memorable now for you and, and the sorts of things that you, you think yeah might, might be taken forward or, or Okay, I mean, I, I think um, I think you know one thing that happened with most of the companies, if not if not all, was um, there was a kind of sense of uh, a freedom that, that that came about. Whereas you know they'd all worked or pretty much you know kind of uh, on stage and um, and uh, <clears throat> and so on and worked in their particular styles. Actually, the the new um, visual. Uh, <clears throat> The new visual toys they had in ter in terms of created uh, creative spaces, but you know virtual settings that can be quite ambitious and spectacular and impossible to achieve on a 
uh, on, on a normal theatre budget or impos impossible um, to do visually uh, on, on stage. People really responded. And I think a lot of the companies, and if you, you read those, ca those case studies, actually said um, they, they really found some new freedom in it and some new ideas. Uh, new, new creative way, um, ways of of going going about things, and maybe being slightly less less precious, more playful, um, more more kind of joyful in 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 what they were doing. So I think that was that was some something that a lot of the theatre theatre companies uh, and dance com dance companies found that there was a uh, a certain freedom from from what was happening, and together with uh, new stylistic stylistic way of, ways of doing things, new visual approaches and, and aesthetic approaches. So it, it, it's that sense of, of finding something new in it and something uh, you know quite quite fun, playful, magical um, that that we're able to cr create create through um, you know pl placing people in you know, in very un unusual and imaginative um, new types of virtual stage set. Great, thank you. Um, I mean, I'm sure we'll touch on some of those things as we, as we progress. So what we, we're, I'm now going to go to our next, next presentation, which is myself. Um, and um, so what I'm going to do now is I just want to just change some, change some, some seats and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm just going to bring up the presentation again. Um, go forward to my next slide. I want to just, um, uh, I'm going to put, take, I'm going to put myself in the speaker's seat <laughs> and um, there we go. And I'm going to take, so take myself out as my responder. Um, there we go. Right. All right. Well, thank you. So as and these, this is a knowledge exchange event. So naturally, Steve and both myself are, are giving more, more kind of what we would call academic papers, I guess, or papers we've given before. And I'm going to give a, paper, a short paper now, a 15 minute paper that I have presented at a, at a conference recently. But it does give you, it, hopefully, it gives you a much clearer um, insight into um, the, the context of, the, of this particular telepresence stage project, where it came from, the context of COVID, of lockdown and what happened during that time, and the sorts of things that have happened since the project. So this is a, this is a short paper um, that I have presented. There's a, there are philosophical elements to this, and that's the nature of my work and what I do. And I, I hope that is useful, and I'm happy to answer more questions on that um, towards it at the end as well. So let me give this paper. I'm going to read it, I'm, I'm afraid. So um, it's not it's not uh, too long, 15, 10, 15 minutes. So let me start. Um, start with this one here, if I can manage this. OK, here we are. So from the start of 2020, we were told to stay home, stay safe and save lives. But while the humans were locked away in their homes, it wasn't all bad. In our absence, goats were coming down from the mountains to reclaim the streets of Llandudno in Wales. <laughs> while wild boars were roaming the streets of Haifa in Israel and herds of deer were grazing on the suburban greens in East London. And there wasn't a vapour trail in sight. By April 2020, air pollution had already reduced by up to 30%. But back in our homes, whilst resorting to baking sourdough bread and cutting our own hair, we were desperately trying to zoom our way out of isolation. So having spent 30 years working with telematics, video conferencing and coexistent telepresence, I was often contacted for advice and comment on how to approach our new COVID found video existence. Since the early 1990s, I've taken a phenomenological approach to combine and relocate distant participants. Um, in, in, in um, yep, yeah, sorry, <laughs> I lost my place looking at the wrong screen. Um, from, yeah, from, 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 um, in social and fictional settings, from life-size projections on shared beds and sitting together on the same green screen sofa, to virtual peace negotiation tables and sharing the same telepresent stage. So although my practice often centers on telematic dreaming as a prime example of third space telepresence by interacting on a projected bed surface, the most effective sense of telepresence actually occurs through the screens that surround each of the beds. I'm just gonna to move this to full screen actually it might just help um, so um, the participants preferred to rely on the two bit on two video screens on either side of the bed to navigate and control their interactions 
but more importantly, preferring to shift their experience in, into the reflected third space. The screen wasn't watched, it was entered like a portal to a coexistent space. And in doing so, they could leave their physical vulnerabilities behind along with their self-conscious inhibitions to engage in the specular image through the observation of the self as other. So my follow-on work from this piece, um, Telematic Vision therefore, relied purely on video screens, removing the superimposed video projection technique from the installation by replacing it with a system of live chroma keying between two video screens in two remote locations. The screens on each side of the sofas significantly enhanced the spatial sense of presence, providing a means of both observation and displacement of the self. My installations, in my installations, the participants not only shared the reflection of the self, but also the gaze upon the other from the same remote camera location. They are effectively sharing the same eyes, the same point of view, where one's gaze of the other and view of the self are conflated. So the objectification of the gaze is confronted on equal empathetic terms through this process of sharing our presence in a third space environment from a single viewpoint. So literally seeing something from someone else's point of view. So as the participants begin to discover this telematic third space and their new immersive coexistence, the telematic technology and geographical distances involved were of least concern and essentially disappear. In the same way, this reflects the ontological claims that Martin Heidegger makes with the example of the hammer as a tool having two states, an innate object when not in use that Heidegger refers to as being present at hand, or as a tool in use performing a task, which is the primary focus of our attention, whereby the object itself disappears in a state that is ready to hand. So we can similarly use the television as an example of Heidegger's hammer. In its off mode, it's clearly a static object occupying space on the table in front of us. But when switched on and through the different degrees of media we engage with and become progressively more immersed in, the television consequently disappears. Our suspension of disbelief and embodiment in the third person content gradually supersedes the tool we are using to view it. But telematic vision takes us a step further. The actions of the embodied character on screen correspond to our own movements through prosthetic agency, reflecting the self in a third person, in a third space existence, or as Jacques Lacan would have it, a bodily wholeness constructed as if on stage in front of us. The final episode in Heidegger's television situates the embodied self image with another participant with whom we are now sitting and can interact, perform and play. The focus of our attention is now solely on an empathetic encounter between the self as reflected other with the other participant together on the same sofa. And at this point, the television itself has completely disappear disappeared, replaced by what is now a portal to a third space coexistence. So let us return to the problem of Zoom. What initially promised to keep families, friends and employees connected during lockdown started to tire as Zoom fatigue set in. The frustration of occupying a box on a screen with a head and shoulders webcam image left many people simply wanting to switch off. The flat, <laughs> image, the flat image of our head and shoulders was as representative of the self as a passport photograph, an innate, what Heidegger referred to as present at hand, subject as object, not in use. But what if that subject were a full body figure and experienced a proprioceptive, a proprioceptive sense of self and other, a body in ready to hand use through coexistent interaction, where the self-conscious image is no longer our concern? What if we could move back from the keyboard and the coexist in the third space that maps our physical surroundings, a space where our movements and tactile experiences of surfaces and objects corresponded to those reflected on screen? being able to move around each other, dance together and hold each other, where empathy for the other prevails and switching off the camera would be equally detrimental to that coexistent telepresence encounter and experience. So my initial lockdown experiments took place in May 2020 with Pandemic Encounters, a collabor collaboration with Third Space Network, hosted and presented as a global laser, where I performed as a live chroma key figure from a green screen installation in my own home, interacting with participants around the world. 
in telematic quarantine, I invited participants, in, including Steve from, from La Salle, uh, to visit me in an uncanny rendering of my actual house. Together, we shared a space to perform, play and improvise in a layered video environment, an experience of domesticity, self-isolation and fantasy in COVID dream, in COVID times. So in contrast to the Zoom grid on the left, the remote telepresent performers on the right were overlaid and composited within digital theatre sets where their full body images could move in between each other and the digital sonography, providing a sense of scale, depth and three-dimensional reality. The chroma, the chroma keying was performed using live video production and on a streaming platform incorporating web real-time communications, what we refer to as WebRTC, an open source protocol for high quality, low latency, peer-to-peer -peer video communication. So the compositing concept worked in a similar way to the 19th century paper theatre when thinking about video as a 2D layer to create backdrops, uh, wings, foreground objects, props and performers cut out from their green screen backgrounds using chroma keying techniques, scaled and placed upstage and downstage in a telepresent equivalent of the paper theatre. So these solution, the outcomes of these experiments led to the research project Collaborative Solutions for Performing Arts, a telepresent stage, providing a fit for purpose online theatre platform for the UK performing arts sector led by myself as principal investigator in collaboration with co-investigator Steve Dixon and research consultants Sita Poppet-Taylor, Satinda Gill and Randall Packer. The research team worked with 10 distinctive performing arts companies between November 2020 and May 2022, and each company undertook a three-month online residency, culminating in a unique telepresence performance involving up to four company members performing together from their separate homes and studios. So I have a showreel I'm going to show you now, and I just want to um, drop to my mouse. <laughs> right, I'm just going to show you this, just play this, this video, this short three minute video with clips, very short, few second clips from each of the projects. So the first one is actually a clip from the um, uh, project Telematic Quarantine, which was a pilot study that I, I did together with with, with Steve um, and other partners in, in the Saal and partners in Australia um, and elsewhere around the world. So this is the first Well, one. come on, open up. Where do you want? Uh, push, push it on, yeah. push it on. He's like the chief medical officer here in England. And he... he... Yeah, oh, wow. That's good, that's good. Oh. Sorry, there's a little bit of tobacco there. Oh, I see. Is, it, is this about my foot on the table? Yeah. Hey! I'm in the corridor. Where are the children? Everything remains open and unending and faintly ridiculous. Just delivering people where they're going. Yeah, well, I'm just a taxi driver. Even if it's a uh, the edge of misery. I got 
a radio call from none other than Get Your Bear. We think that Doug used his tea towel to wrap it around Albert's neck. And I strangled him with my binocular strap. Wait! <laughs> A washerwoman washes rats. Scrub, scrub, scrub. She was still there when I went to bed. So each individual performer was supplied with a large green screen backdrop, LED video lights, a webcam, and two video monitors positioned on either side of the green screen. This provided them with the ability to monitor the monitor the performance on both sides of the green screen as well as straight ahead using the using their computer screen, giving them complete observation and control of, of the tele, their telepresent performance from all three available angles. So creation theatre concentrated on one single scene with two performers interacting across a small square table. Whilst they appear to be sitting at the same table, they were in fact miles apart, sitting at separate green tables against green screen backdrops. Their tables were exactly lined up with those in the painting, allowing the two actors to inhabit and explore Suzanne's card player's scene, just as if they shared the same physical table. The ability to touch and feel the surface of the tabletop, albeit painted green, whilst observing their self-image, touching the painterly impressionistic surface of Suzanne's card table, enabled the actors to further embody their telepresent other through an extended sense of touch, or, or as Maurice Merleau-Ponte would have it, an extension of bodily synthesis. So in October 2020, I developed the online telepresent encounter Coombe Hill or High Water, a dystopian post-Brexit narrative that presents two online telepresent participants trying to carry on as normal, waking up in flood water, distilling their own fuel and driving into the hills to escape with no real plan only to find themselves back where they started, but worse. The work is a dark, absurd satire on ecological ignorance, told through a symbiosis of storytelling and telepresence, using telematic resources to counter it. So I have just a few more slides, and I think I'm just going to go full screen on these ones to show you. These are my, um, these are my students, actually. Two of my students exploring and experimenting this, please. Um, waking up in bed together, um, surrounded by detritus left from the receding flood water. They end up in the flood water, just as Jeff Bezos tries to escape, and raw sewage pours in. They um, take a look at the news on this from the sofa. There's a scene that develop, builds out of that. But I should just add that, that this particular piece, I'm only using their, their head and shoulder image. So those legs are augmented on them. So they're literally just using the regular laptop interaction through their, their mounted webcam. Um, they take to the hills in a clapped out old mini metro, which inevitably breaks down and they have to camp out at night, but they have some, find some pleasure in playing with their, sh making some shadow theater inside the tent. But um, they end up in a kind of hallucinatory state, having sort of perhaps consumed something on the mountains or some, ingested something from the sewage, who knows, but it's there for them to decide, it's a completely improvised piece and it's very open, it's completely open for online um, uh, internet participation. So that's that's the end of my my talk, and um, I can um, go back to here. Um, I'm happy to take some questions. I'm, I hope I haven't run over, gone over time. I probably have. Um, we're, we're about due to take a short break, but I'll bring Steve up quickly. If there's any questions, um, Steve, you wanted to pose or chair, I'll bring the team in. Oh, I think you might be on, might be on mute, Steve. Classic. Um, yeah, and maybe, maybe I will hand over uh, to to everyone else to ask ask questions. I have I have one or two pre prepared, but uh, uh, I'll ha hand over uh, for anyone's initial reaction or any any questions to Paul. Yeah. Yeah, the, this whole approach is is very visual. Uh, a very a, a large and substantial group of disabled people are visually impaired. How difficult would it be to add audio description into this technology, instantaneous audio description? Yeah, um, it, it, this is it's just a really good, interesting 
good question. It's, I know that it's something that Jamie is also very interested in about audio description and how we how we how we develop that and use that and how we probably can bring that in. Um, we we I think in this I mean the the sort of the immediate answer. I think we are reliant on on digital tools to to um, auto auto um, uh, certainly auto translation um, and. And then there might be other other tools, other support we need for other great wider description of of the scene. I appreciate that, that the audio dis, audio description is much wider than purely the, the sort of spoken dialogue. Um, yeah. I'm, 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 and I'm new to this, so please tell me if if it isn't, or or if it would be would because I think there are some potentially we can have um, there is there is a potential for automated um, audio. Uh, uh, trans translation. Uh, uh, yeah, dialogue that's creation. that's not really the problem. I think there is a technology that people can have add that to their screens and so on. It's much more a really a subjective thing of somebody actually describing what they are seeing. Mm -hmm. it, like you take the last one there, it's the, describing the detrius on the floor of the bedroom the two heads in in amongst all the sewage and, and then that. And I don't think there's a technology yet available that can do that. So you might have to have someone as part of it. But that, that was my thinking. I think you're right. And I think this is something this is this is the this is the creative challenge. And I think this is how mm. how do we build that in? How do you build that into a project like this without it being feeling like a um, a kind of an add on? You know, how does mm. it feel more more part of the creative endeavor, the part of the creative project? That that audio description is actually part mm. of part of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, we we might want to ask ourselves, well, what maybe it could work the other way around. We work we work with audio and think, well, what are the images we need to, we need to provide? Mm. You know, mm. as well. And that that's what some of the theatre groups do now. You know, so there's someone describing what's going on on the stage as part of the the dialogue that's going on. You know. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting and really good point. I really and I know that it, it is very crucial to the work that the cryptic arts are doing, and they're they're interested in that and that question as well. And how 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 we how we find a solution or, or find new creative ways of doing that. So I think from that perspective, when you're talking about technical solutions, it's also about whether the audio description is going to be open or closed. That if you're directing it down a specific channel only for people who've selected that then you need another channel of communication for the additional sound which sometimes a telephone conference call is actually what's used or at least was early in lockdown i think though from my perspective that we've always tried to have the audio description creatively embedded within the yeah. script and the soundtrack and the approach to the work so mm. that it doesn't also that thus far for us it hasn't brought up additional technical questions. Mm. Um, one of the challenges with the project and the work I'm envisaging at the moment is that the play itself is set in an abstract-ish, kind of an abstracted hospital and then abstracted places where it is the audio description that gives a lot of the audience a sense of placement for the work and one of the things we're considering is the idea of the live performer on stage also being the face of the telepresence so that you're seeing them both performing a play in a theatre but you've also brought the same performer into a visual world projected behind them of what is actually happening so in that visual world you've got a very constructed hospital You've got all of the locations that are kind of implied with sound and embedded audio description kind of present in their fullness. So you see the performer both performing themselves on stage, but also living through the work that they're telling the story of having lived through. And that's where I think I'm starting to become more aware with audio description that we can you know, we don't need to say you're in a hospital because you can hear beeping monitors. You can mm. you can get that sense. But if we've got what's happening on stage being very visually different to what's being projected up behind the stage and what would be going out online, 
then I think that does become a more challenging question of how do we do that? And at the moment, I think my instinct is honestly towards the pre-show briefing that kind of runs through and sets all of the places so that then when you know which place we're in, you've already had the pre-description so you understand what it's like rather than relying on all of the description coming at that moment in the script. Um, I think you know, one of our key motivations with this is to explore the fact that we can commission work from people who are far more unwell as well as disabled mm. if we've got resilient processes for performances that don't rely on being in person. So at the moment, mm. I have a high quality film of anything I do so that if I end up in hospital, we've got we've got that, we've still got something for the audience. And this feels like a kind of a step up for that. Mm. But it does also raise some really interesting questions about how if we've got two visual things going on, the live play in front of the audience and the projector showing the performer, I guess, experiencing the experiences that are explored in the live play, then you've got a lot more visual layers that you're going to need to unpack. Mm. Mm. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot in that, Jamie. There's a really, really is. I mean, it'd be good to sort of pick up on some of them, those points um, later as well. I think you're, yeah. there's, a, there's an awful lot of layering, potential layering going on. All I would say is that I think, and I know, and I know that I, it's difficult, and I, I'm very well familiar with some of this technology. And this is also about that sort of knowledge transfer as well. I want, I want to enable that to happen with the technologies that, that, that we have available to us. So there is a lot we can do here, and I'm going to talk about some of those things later on about those sort of those the, the hybrid nature of, of your your work and your interest, and what what we can try and do with that, and how we can try and bring those experiences and, and converge those those spa those spaces, the online, the 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 the, the, the live performance um, in in multiple ways, and and really just sort of try and explore that further. I hope we can, we'll have time to. To come mm -hmm. back to that shortly. Um, I'm just conscious we're going to take a quick, quick break. I think that was that was my my intention. If that's okay, I no. would like to take a short break myself. So, so if we could, what, I know we're now we were going to start back with Richard at, at, um, at half past eleven. I'm wondering if we can just come back, just just take f just five minutes. We'll come back. Just uh, just leave your cameras on. Is that okay, yeah. Richard? We're starting about about five minutes, three three minutes. Well, the program says Trish, but. Oh, I'm so sorry. You're quite right. You're quite right. You're absolutely yeah. right. Trish, we're going to come back with Trish. Trish, and, and uh, is that okay, Trish? We'll come back. Uh, yes, that's fine. Five minutes. Brilliant. Okay. And I, will, I, will, I will complete the... Um, let me just move on. Fade that over. So I'll hold that there for the moment. We'll be back in, in five minutes with, with Trish. Here we are. Ones there. Sorry, I think Richard's not back yet, but <laughs> we shall. I'm going to put. I'm going to now hand over in a moment um, to Trish, Trish Wheatley from um, Disability Arts Online. Um, and um, Trish, I'm going to put you into the the driving seat. Okay. Here we are. Here we are. Now you've got your website in the background on the screen. I can go Excellent. full. I can go full screen on that if you wish as well. So just let me know, and I can also. It's also interactive. I can actually click around in your website if you want to. You, you can't. I can. So, <laughs> so great. Uh, All right. So I'll can, direct I can, you if I need I can, to. I can, I, can, I can choose things on here and move around. So please do if you want to. Over to you. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. So yeah, I'm Trish. I'm the chief executive of Disability Arts Online, and I've been with the organisation since 2011. It was originally set up by Colin Hambrook, who can't be here today because of COVID unfortunately um, and our role in this project is as a dissemination partner and a critical friend. So uh, when Co um, Colin was going to explain why he set uh, Disability Arts Online up in the first place so I will attempt to, to, to give that story although it's always much better in his own words. Um, it, Colin is a disabled artist himself, he's, an, he's a visual artist and poet and prior to setting up Disability Arts Online, he worked in um, he worked within Disability Arts for London Disability Arts Forum, and was the editor of uh, Disability Arts in London magazine for quite some time. So he was working in 
critique and publishing prior to Disability Arts Online. And really the, the reason he set up Disability Arts Online was at that moment in the uh, sort of early 2000s when um, there was disinvestment in the local disability arts forums and um, there was a need for a, a space for disabled creatives to find peer support and encouragement to professionalise their practice. So one of the main reasons for the existence of Disability Arts Online is to provide critique of work that comes from a place of lived experience and understanding because uh, art and theatre critics at that time would not go near the work of disabled artists for fear of get, getting it wrong, but also because of their preconceptions around work by disabled artists not, you know, not being at the standard that it should be. So um, the, the role of Disability Arts Online really originally was to uh, support uh, development of creative practice and to create a, a space where that could be discussed and critiqued and to connect disabled creatives together. So what we do now, 20 years later, is, is very much the same thing. Um, and as an organisation, we, we have a Brighton address, but we have a national and international remit. And we have a staff team of eight across the country from the south coast right up to Edinburgh. And we work with around 125 disabled freelance artists and writers per year with paid opportunities. Um, and everything is centred around our mission to champion dis uh, disability arts and culture through nurturing creativity, connection and critique. So really that mission hasn't uh, veered too much from, from uh, Colin's original vision. Um, so a lot of what we do can be seen on our website, which is sort of what we are mainly known for. But actually, there's a lot of behind the scenes work that we deliver as well in order to, to, to achieve that mission. So we've got four main areas of work that I thought would be useful to just give you a flavour of the things that we do. Uh, the first part is our creative programme. So that includes that space for critique and to debate uh, and debate that sort of shifts perceptions around disability. So we do that through through the online magazine. But we also run an events programme, uh, which is hybrid with um, place based partners and also online only events. We've committed to our events programme always having an online element um, for access reasons. And that's that's since the pandemic. Um, and we also run a, a whole range of projects as and when needed in various different areas. Alongside that creative programme, we have a talent development programme, which includes it, it really engages disabled people in, in the idea of being becoming a creative right from the very early stages. A lot of people that we work with are discovering a disability identity for the first time. So uh, coming into our community and reading our blogs and, and connecting with people is is for often the first time that disabled people have heard of things like the social model. Um, uh, so it's a really, it, we can provide a really important uh, space of connection. But from there, we also provide webinars and resources, one to one sessions and through to artist associateships where we work intensively with an artist over a period of 12 to 18 months. Um, the third area of our work is sector development. So we have a strong sort of advocacy and training um, element to our work, working as consultants within the arts and cultural sector to help increase access and support organisations to work uh, in, a, in a more uh, accessible and, and, and um, yeah, co connected way with disabled artists. Um, and quite often that leads to strategic partnership programs where we'll actually co-deliver work that um, addresses a specific need and then underpinning all, all of that sort of public and sector facing work is our organizational development and that aims to improve our processes and systems as we learn to ensure that we create sustainable disabled led and intersectional working practices so it's great to see our current website up on the screen, but actually I have some really exciting news in that we are redeveloping the website totally. Um, we're updating our brand, we're changing the navigation, 
and we're sort of getting ready for the next sort of technological phase of our uh, of our work. So some things will still be quite familiar, but some things will be um, a bit different. <laughs> um, so we're working really, really hard behind the scenes to um, to, to get that ready. So there's just a few elements of kind of how we support performing arts in particular, because we're a cross art form organisation. I thought it would be useful just to pinpoint for, for the for, for the context of this project, really. Um, something that artists really get from what we do is that unique disability perspective from our reviews um, that's often lacking in mainstream reviews. So whilst there has been progress in terms of mainstream critique of, of work by disabled artists, um, often that comes from a non-disabled perspective. So we're still giving that unique disability perspective and we get lots of feedback from artists saying how useful that can be in the development of their, their work. We also aim to like Quite, take quite a strategic approach to the reviews that we do. So um, we pick shows that have sort of a landmark level of importance, such as Liz Carr performing The Normal Heart at the National Theatre and um, uh, Access All Areas, um, other company, Not Your Circus Dog, uh, with Not Fucking Sorry. So there's kind of there's, there's those things that we really try and pinpoint because we don't have loads of capacity to go out reviewing everything. Um, we also have um, critics development programmes. We specifically worked with um, Creative Scotland recently to run a diverse critics programme in Scotland in partnership with The Skinny. Um, and and some other partners to to develop d d disabled voices in in critiquing as well, and um, I think it's also to, important to mention the Transforming Leadership Program, where we worked with Access All Areas Theatre Company to support learning disabled and neurodivergent theatre practitioners to forge new paths into leadership positions. So there's a whole kind of wide range of ways that we interact with the performing arts and and support the development of, of it. Um, I'm not sure how much time I've got left, but I'm just going to conclude with just sort of what our aims are to, to, to support this, this programme and project in, specifically. We are going to be hosting a project blog, so we would like any of the partners to contribute to that. And we'll be reviewing the works, the works in progress and using that sort of critical friend role to help inform the end symposium, which we also support to help make sure it's accessible and sort of in a sort of co-production role. Uh, so I think that's about it. Got no idea how long I took, but I hope that was okay. <laughs> Thank you, Trish, that's great. Wonderful. I, I'm gonna bring Richard in actually uh, to join you here. Um, and um, to put you there, Richard, if I may. Hello. And, um, Hi. Just really, just to see if there's any, if we have any, any questions, um, and just to sort of bring in our, our, our team again on screen, I'll do that as well. But Richard, did you or, or a response from Richard? Well, I, <coughs> I think do. that on any, yeah, I mean, I think it's really the role of Disability Arts Online is crucial actually in the UK to maintain disability arts but also the wider issue of, of the disability perspective and that it's absolutely true that you know the early 2000s was a, a desert for not just for um, disability arts organizations but disability organizations themselves because and that was then replicated in the 2010s to now with the austerity measures which are accelerating again which of course cut local authority grant to any local organization so it's a major to have that as a focus i think has been a well a lifeline for a lot of people so that's where i come from and not as a performer but someone as a disability advocate a rights advocate but um, i think it's uh, really interesting that um, this, if you like it, how do you get, I suppose my question to Tricia, how do we get out of the this sort of niche area to getting some of this thinking into the more mainstream? Because you, you mentioned critiques, non-disabled critics have been slow 
to actually adopt uh, the tools of criticism because they're too frightened because they don't understand and it isn't that difficult to understand the, the sort of paradigm shift that's necessary to, to be uh, an ally of disabled people. How do we get to that? How do you see the, the work that you're doing getting to that? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think it's probably a multifaceted approach. Um, so I think we need to be seen as innovators. Mm -hmm. And so projects like this, where we're actually leading the way in innovation for um, like platforms that could be used, not just, it's not just by disabled people, but by a whole mm -hmm. creative community. Mm -hmm. I think actually leading the way with that sort of work will help get us mm. seen and gets recognised as innovators. Mm. Um, but also it's challenging bad practice when you mm. see it mm. and calling out like stuff that shouldn't be there. So a bit mm. of a campaigning mm. and an advocacy role um, and t supporting the development of really, really high quality work so that it, it stands up to the criticism that it should do. Mm. We've we've often toyed with the idea of maybe, you know, working more collaboratively with mainstream journalists and, mm. and um, providing training for them. But we mm. haven't we haven't quite got there yet. I think mm. it's um, I think we are better to get more representation of disabled people within journalism as well um, as a as a solution to that. Yeah. Does anyone else want to come in with uh, any questions or points to Trish? Just, just a quick comment, just on the on what you were saying there, Trish. I think it's really that that level of innovation that that, that is broad, you know, for, is a is innovative across a number of fields. Is really what we're trying to aim at here. It's not we're not you know, obviously a lot of these things we, we, we are very much appropriate. We'll we'll look at expanding the possibilities of what we can do in in. For, for access and for inclusion of everybody. Um, but really we're, what we're looking to do and what, what we're hoping with our final symposium event that you're, you're gonna be convening is really we're gonna be take, taking this to the next level, you know, that this is actually gonna be the sort of thing that people can look at and, and we'll just see what 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 possible what huge possibilities there are, um, mm. and with with the performances as well. So I'm really excited about what we can do with that and this platform and how we reach an audience like you have, which is with with with, with the, uh, the disability arts online have to have a huge audience. So that's going to be really exciting mm. for us to to to, to mm. be part of that. Yeah. Anyone else? Great. Well, I'll hand no. it to you, Richard. Is that okay? I'm going to bring yeah, up you're going to you're going to put now. up my presentation. I am, I am. Yes. All right. That, that's the well, while you're doing that, I'll introduce myself because Please. I've already contributed several uh, times. But I have several jobs at the moment. Uh, my background is as an educator. I was uh, disabled since I was nine months from polio a long time ago now, 1949, uh, and so therefore grew up through a school system, private and mainstream, uh, and segregation. So. Uh, and really, I didn't, uh, like a lot of disabled people growing up at that time, I didn't see it as a collective issue. It was my individual problem to deal with. And it was only when I got, uh, went into education after working in industry and uh, became a teacher. And uh, before that, I was a researcher at university. And uh, it was really some personal things that happened to me that forced me to actually look at the generalized oppression that there is towards disabled people and since then early sort of 1987 really when um, I wrote some material on, for education on this bringing disability as an equality issue into it uh, I've been campaigning really for this change that we need to bring about throughout the world so uh, currently I run the disability history month now in its 14th year uh, which I founded back in 2010 when it appeared that the government was uh, that had just come in, the coalition government was going to undo most of what we'd achieved over the previous 20 years. And we needed to look at that and also learn from my history and go forward. So we have annual events and lots of people now doing it all over the place. I'll say more about that. I also run the Commonwealth Disabled People's Forum and as the elected general secretary. So I'm reaching out into 56 countries and I can already see lots of things that we could do to actually spread this around 
because it's we we have a, a common language generally of English in the because of the imperial past, so that uh, it's actually quite a, a useful medium to have. Uh, and then I also run my own consultancy, which is aiming at making education around the world inclusive. So no small agenda there. Um, but anyway, let's go into my presentation. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Right, so Disability History Month, when we set it up, uh, was the aim was to challenge disabilism, which is the sort of systematic oppression and prejudice towards disabled people that has existed for a long, long time, really as long as there have been human beings, uh, there has been some form of uh, othering going on because of people's physical or mental state. To then against that background, celebrate our lives and achievements at, at, at all times in history, and then looking forward, what do we need to do to achieve equality for disabled people? And we look at the window of all of that through our history and each, uh, yeah, we we'll look at it from a different theme and take stock. Uh, next. Yeah, the social model's been mentioned, but it's core to uh, to what we're doing. Maybe we can have this on the larger screen, the whole screen, yeah, uh, so people can see it. I think this transformation, which started in the UK in the eight, uh, 1970s uh, and spread out to join up with other groups of people who were beginning to challenge the way that they were treated as other, as uh, objects rather than being subjects, came together in a, a big walkout of an international conference in 1980 in Canada. 400 delegates walked out of the International Rehabilitation Conference and set up an alternative. And the British disability movement were leaders in that, along with people from Singapore. Uh, nod to you there, uh, Steve. Uh, that, Zimbabwe, uh, the Caribbean and so on. So it wasn't just a, a Eurocentric thing. It was something that was happening around the world at that time. And it was basically saying you need to see us not through the lens of our impairment. You need to see us through the response that society has to that impairment. Uh, which leads to a lack of our financial independence, segregation, charity models, the language we use, attitude, fear, lack of inclusion, charge it, uh, the way services are charged for, lack of transport, lack of access, including online, isolation, housing, prejudice, attitudes, built design, ignorance, labelling. In fact, the whole environment is designed without us in mind. So we have as an alternative now through the UN Convention, which we managed to get in 2006, embodying this principle, uh, which now 186 countries have ratified, which means it's in, it should be in law in all of those countries. So only a handful of countries not, including the United States. Um, so next. So we, our themes, look at that from different, uh, in different years. And if you go onto our website, there is a broadsheet produced every year. There's also material that people all around the country produce that we try and capture, but we don't get all of it because it's rather amorphous. We just say, this is the theme and this is the month. And then people go and do their own things. But a lot of universities are doing stuff. The NHS does it. Many of the trade unions do it. Uh, work, certain workplaces, uh, schools, our main focus has been on education. Uh, the education unions support it, but also uh, a growing minority of schools make it a theme in, in their, their curriculum. So I think about 13% of schools now nationally uh, do something around it. So the, our struggle for rights, changing lives, hate crimes, celebrating our struggle for independent living, which is important. War and impairment, a huge issue we did on the 100th anniversary of the start of the First World War, where large numbers were killed, but three times as many came back as disabled and were forgotten largely. So quite interesting response there. Portrayal in the media, which is something I've been involved with before, doing work with BFI and before that, the one in eight group. Uh, we took stock then of, of portrayal and representation, which is much less. So portrayal is how, you know, disability being mentioned. Representation is where it's actually people, disabled people themselves are involved in that. Disability in language, which I'll show you a clip of. Visual arts, which there was a lot there. Music, <coughs> leadership, uh, access issues, how far we come. Disability relationships and sex, hidden impairments, health and well-being. Uh, this last year was children, 
and youth and uh, this coming year is going to be uh, work and employment next. So something about our black triangle, the black triangle was the symbol the Nazis used to put on the useless eaters as they called us. Starting from 1933, the National Socialists brought in compulsory sterilization for about 800,000 disabled people and then moved towards a mass killing of disabled people. Prior to the Holocaust being applied to Jews, most of the methods that were used to exterminate on a mass basis were tried out on disabled people in six killing centers in Germany from uh, 1939 onwards under a program called T4. Hitler says in Mein Kampf he drew very strongly on American uh, and British social science, uh, released the stranglehold of hereditary disease and unfitness. This was very strong uh, and it, it's, uh, it just took it to its logical extreme with propaganda films, posters such as this one showing how much it costs to educate the useless deaf-blind eaters in, in, in schools. And there you have some of the people with learning difficulties that were put in the camps wearing the black triangle. So what we thought we would do as our symbol, as our darkest day, was to turn the triangle round. So we use that as our symbol next. And so we also get a logo designed usually for each of the, which people can then use to, to badge their stuff that they use. Here are some of them that we've had for disability and art, the frame, the access, looking at some of the changes there or uh, portrayal of disability now and then. And when we did the portrayal, uh, um, we also, uh, or was it the language? It was one or other. We, we also had a, the park theatre. We ran a whole day on disability and theatre, which was quite an interesting way with about 60 practitioners with Grey Eye Theatre, we ran that. Uh, Disability, health and well-being, looking at the uh, shocking effects of both COVID and uh, the austerity measures, which account for an additional 500,000 deaths in this country that wouldn't have happened if it hadn't have been for those policies and particularly the policies of uh, herd immunity to start with, which were completely wrong, and then eugenicist style uh, approaches which are being now uncovered in, in the uh, inquiry, but particularly the way people were contaminated in, in, in um, homes and other places. Uh, and then the barriers in education, which are worse now than have ever been in the history of the UK. There are more children in segregated education in 2023 than at any time in the history of the state education system. So the current measures of the government are absolutely anti the education of disabled people and are actually throwing out more and more and that this is these are major scandals but it's very hard to get these things through into the mass media next so disability portrayal in the image i've fixed on this because i think it's particularly interesting and should really be in the curriculum on media studies but most media studies don't actually look at portrayal of disability at all uh, and, you know, a mixture here of uh, positives, apart from the, the first couple uh, over on the right hand side, uh, the um, uh, uh, film, silent films, it's worth noting that there was a massive over representation in silent films of disabled people. And that's quite interesting because of the visual metaphor that we can be used as and that metaphor has been carried on and it's something we'll have to watch for in this whole visually based approach that we're taking because I think it, it's easy. Freaks was an early film which you know was banned but it also was trying to show life from the excluded of a, a, a number of circus performers who were actually had real impairments and could only make a living by by being on show uh, and uh, some early things or best years of our life, which looks at including a disabled actor, uh, men coming back from the Second World War. And that sort of social realist approach really was knocked off the agenda, certainly in Hollywood, by uh, the uh, McCarthyism and the whole un-American activities. All of that was banned and most of the productive people were exiled. Uh, after the 60, late, late 60s, 70s, we've come back into a more socially realist thing, but it's up and down 
and I'm talking about mainstream media here, it, it just breaks through every so often, maybe two or three times a year we see something on uh, a drama on television that has been commissioned, maybe not even as much as that. And I think this is uh, the, how we get this in the public eyes, really, through drama and other things. We did have some success in the 90s in getting all the soap editors together under a campaign we call One in Eight, where we actually got a mainstream storyline into every soap within one year. So that was quite an achievement. So you can actually do quite a lot by challenging the way people think about this. So I, it is worth doing, and I th hope that this can be part of this project. Next. Yeah, this was our theme, uh, as I say, was uh, children, uh, disability, childhood and youth. Uh, and we had a, an exploration of this. We didn't get a great response, and I think that's really down to the adults working in education, because it was open right up until those who were 25. We had about 10 things sent into us, some interesting dance pieces and some other things all on the website. But I wanted to focus on this uh, short poem from an 11 year old boy with autism who's quite isolated living in East Anglia uh, to just give you a flavour of what you get when you ask for it and people respond. Can we do the video on that? Autism. Thunder and lightning strike me again, making the thundering bulldozers in my eardrums get going that I can say. Whether it is people shouting, vehicles rumbling, or anything else ear piercing, the bulldozers attack. Roses are red, violets are blue, but what co colour is autism? I have not a clue. Take me books, take me away to somewhere where it is silent, so I can be free on this treasure island. No smells of disgusting food or any weird artefacts that have the texture of strange. Just peaceful and relaxing, with nothing to bother me. But no, this is Earth, a planet that does nothing but put pressure on you. When you go to the door, the planet has taken away your other shoe. When you go to collect something that someone has told you to collect, it turns out that it is not even there. Thanks. So yeah, that so I picked that because I think it's quite relevant. Forty percent of. Uh, Children with an education health care plan in England are now identified as on the on the neurodiverse autistic spectrum. And I was at a seminar of SEN experts yesterday, about 30 of them who were trying to tr come up with a framework for any new incoming government to begin to challenge this. And the real problem is if you are othering through a statutory process that the more different you are, the more uh, deficit you are, the more funding you attract and the more likely you are to be pushed somewhere else, when in fact we should be actually changing all of our mainstream schools, our curriculum and the way schools functions to include the neurodiverse. And I put the example that in the 1990s we had a similar alarm bells running with a big increase in diagnosed dyslexia. So what did we do? We trained all the teachers to actually be able to deal with it now. 98% of kids with dyslexia are in mainstream schools. So it's not about seeing the problem in the person, it's about having social model responses. And that doesn't exercise, despite the fact that the UK government is a signatory and has ratified the UN convention, it has excluded education from that because of these problems and they fail, face, won't do that. So that came up very strongly in this year next. Uh, in music, we uh, just I hi highlighted the large number of disabled mainstream music performers who uh, had impairments. And in fact, their impairment was an essential part of their uh, activity. And I think, uh, you know, from Mozart and Beethoven right across to Ian Dury, Roland Kirk, uh, Joni Mitchell and a whole range of others, a particular genre of black blues singers who nearly all had impairments and so on. So this is a cultural mediation which isn't looked at and it doesn't really figure in disability arts. This is mainstream arts which is fueled by people's disability and it's quite interesting and it's something we, we haven't really analysed anywhere near enough. Next. Uh, yeah, so this was uh, in 2016, we did language. I think you might need to be on a small, make it back smaller again because we're losing some of the screen pool uh, to show this next clip. 
which is a piece of work that students at Leeds University did in response to us calling for uh, uh, work on language in that year. Yeah, let's have the clip. So you're still losing some of the, you say you're losing some of the screen. I'm not sure why. Well, I, it was, the, the the far margin was off. So if we can show just the, the bit where the film is, that would okay. be great to do it can you, can you full see screen. It is that okay? Yeah, start it. Yeah, that's probably all right. often it's not just your impairment it's how society treats you because of your impairment that is actually disabling and actually what causes me personally to suffer okay yeah so i think getting that uh, perspective across and that young people young disabled people in university and colleges are taking on this perspective to to say it's not my problem you know and standing together with solidarity has been perhaps the most important uh point about the international disability movement and brings in disability arts to gel and create understanding around that but you can just see if those students had access to the technology we're talking about what a much greater uh impact they could have on the way they were actually representing it they could have actually had all the barriers there visualized for people to see the problems and so on so i think there's a great uh, potential in this uh, which is why we've come in as consultants on the project as well so let's just go on i think i've got one more yeah so there was a regional news piece so we are breaking through into the mainstream media this appeared on regional news across itn at the week the beginning of a disability history month in last december uh november december yeah let's go with this clip next tonight disabled people across the country calling for disability history month to be taught more widely in schools. From Albert Einstein to Beethoven and more recently Stephen Hawking, history is full of disabled people who changed the world. But exclusive research from ITV News shows that 43% of teachers here in the east of England don't feel they have the resources or the advice they need to teach it. Catherine Walker explains. Daniel from Suffolk is one of 1.2 million disabled children across the UK. He's proud of his identity and is disappointed that more schools aren't celebrating Disability History Month. I think really, like, uh, my life in school would actually definitely improve because the other students would learn about Disability History Month. They'd know a little bit about my deafness and the barriers that I face every day. And people aren't really always aware of that or about the communication, how to adapt to a deaf person. So I think it would improve that greater awareness. Disability History Month runs from the 16th of November to the 16th of December, but a survey by ITV News found that 43% of teachers in the east of England don't think they have the resources or advice they need to teach it. 28% said it wasn't a priority for their school leadership team, and 76% said they faced time pressure in a cramped curriculum. Only 13% of head teachers across the country confirmed their school was definitely celebrating. 
Well, I think after 14 years, that's a bit shocking, really, because I think if you ask them about Pride Month or uh, Black History Month, they'd all be saying they were doing something, yet they've got more children in most of their schools who are disabled, and they have a duty as public bodies to promote disability equality for disabled people. So we've been doing our unit on um, attitudes towards disability through time. It's an issue that Kate Wilson has been working hard to address. Worried about the lack of options for her students, she designed her own disability history curriculum. A couple of years ago, we introduced a unit on disability over time. So we look at the theme of disability from medieval times right up to present day and how attitudes towards disability today have very much been shaped by historical views on that subject. Right, so I'll stop to mind up my comments there, but I think you can see the gap that's there in all areas of life that we have to transform. And we've actually not been going forward in this country. Other parts of the world are going forward, but not as fast as they should be. But we're definitely under this, the last 13 years of this government and really some of the last years of the Labour government before going backwards. And this is because of us lack of our visibility, lack of us getting there into the mainstream so that our issues are taken up and creating understanding. And one of the big issues in schools and colleges is bullying. And we think that by creating an understanding in the same way as we've created an understanding about uh, different uh, sexualities and so on, it, you can also understand Black Lives Matter and so on. That has actually really transformed the level of uh, homophobic and racist bullying. Disability bullying is still number one and it isn't really coming down. So we think preparing and finding tools for education, but also tools for public education, which could use this uh, tele uh, metric methods would be really useful. But we also think any opportunity to get these ideas across is really important. So if you like, we are sort of coming from the theoretical and educational background on disability issues and disability equality and sort of complement uh, disability online, I hope, yeah, as Great. consultants. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. We're running a little bit over time, but I, I want, to, want to carry on. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring Jane, Jane Lloyd in as your responder and just to sort of um, to manage any questions as well. And I'm just going to bring up the, bring up the, um, the, uh, the team on screen as well. So let's just bring you up here. Uh, here we are. We're all still here. Fantastic. That's over to you, Jane. Do you want to? <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Richard, for a really interesting and informative presentation. I think it's been really helpful for me just to hear the kind of wider context and history within your presentation and all of the other ones so far, um, and just to really reflect on where we are and where we perhaps go next. Um, it's clear that there's a lot that's been achieved, but also a long way to go in many ways. Um, I just wonder, does anyone have any questions? I, I, I do. <laughs> I have a question. Or um, maybe a point of oh, view. Right, maybe, got... Jane, if you wanted to, to just to... there's a question on the screen. There. Is there a question yeah. on, on Teams? Great. Okay, go for that one first. Great. Hi, do you want to come in, Thomas? Okay. Yeah, uh, Richard. When do you start promoting this year's uh, Disability Month? I'm just thinking about the planning and preparation. Yeah, lots of people. Are... Obviously, they want to prepare in the summer yeah. for November. Yes, and particularly because our theme really affects all workplaces this, uh, and uh, people who prepare people for the, a life of work, which includes unpaid work because it's, there's a lot of disabled people who never get paid work, but there's no reason why they can't do volunteering and other things which are socially useful. Uh, and I think we need we usually put that up about this time on, on the web page. So we put up the date and the theme and a lot of people put it into their calendars. Several have already rung me and asked for it. It's going to be from the 14th of November to the 20th of December this year with the theme disability work and employment. And we hope to partner with the, the Disabled Workers Committee of the TUC to run several events. 
uh, and actually to maybe produce some more guidance for workplaces uh, as we come up to the month. But uh, what I will do is produce a, a, a 16 to 20 page broadsheet, which is also in different formats that's on our website, which usually is up by the end of September with an easy read format and, uh, you know, and so on. Looking at the history of our employment, the ideas like the Reserve Army of Labour and all of these different things that have been around for a long time, which really this technology now makes uh, redundant in many ways. As long as you can move a finger, if you have any sort of physical or sensory impairment, you can be part of the world on the internet and therefore you can, can have useful, gainful employment actually. So that, it's about getting that idea across, I think, uh, as much as anything this year. Thank you. Sorry, Paul, were you trying to say I was, I was only going to ask one quick question, if, if Richard wouldn't mind. It was, we raised a really interesting point when you showed the, um, the, the media the the the, the, the um, disabled people in in the in the media in cinema and you talked about very yeah. early silent movies and and the kind of cliches yeah. and pitfalls that they that they yeah. fell yeah. into could you just yeah. elaborate on that a little bit I found that very intriguing that point yeah was. there's a book by a guy called Norden which is the history of the first hundred years of moving image in America it doesn't extend to Europe but uh, as they were sort of the leaders really established quite early although there were lots of similar uh, things, particularly in Germany and Czech Republic and various other places, the UK. Uh, it's the dominance of the US as sort of, uh, and France as, as, as built. But because it was a silent movie, so you've got lots of one reelers that lasted just a minute, a minute and a half, where the gag was to have a disabled guy and someone made up to look like him and a car ran over the double amputee's legs. Uh, so you have him okay. before and after. That was it. That was all it was. Or nailing uh, a man with a wooden leg, his nail to the uh, his leg to the floor. So he went round in circles. Lots of visual gags that were at our expense, really. Mm. Uh, and this uh, and many of the classics were remade in the silent movie period. So Treasure Island, I think, five times. Uh, before the speaking, uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame again, uh, and some actors specialised in playing disabled parts. They weren't disabled people, uh, but they they did they did this, and uh, I think it set the style for Hollywood when the speaking movie came in, uh, and so a lot of it playing on pity uh, stereotypes, reinforced pity, evil. You look at the link between disability and horror films, there's always uh, master, master, the, the hunchback who's supporting these stereotype portrayals have deeply embedded into Western culture from this. And it still goes on on television and now in computer games, the same thing is happening, recycling over and over again of these stereotypes, which are lazy and people are uncritical. Uh, and I think it's, it's, you know, it's a big issue, actually. Can I just ask a follow on question yeah. from that? So well, it sort of follows on, but you mentioned when you were talking about kind of being aware, being aware mm. of that kind of metaphor and it being a very mm. visual based mm. approach that we're taking yeah. in this um, project. And I think we'd already kind of discussed earlier the kind of audio description and mm. ways that can kind of work with those things. I just wondered if there's any more to kind of add around that kind of potential learning and development that might come out of thinking around um, the environments and the visual approach that we're working with. Going to yeah, work I, I think, you know, the, the, if you look at the film Avatar, right, which was a commercial mainstream film, it was about a, a paraplegic soldier who was put into another bodily form uh, as an alien uh, on the, uh, and four, three or four times his size on, on this planet that was being exploited by a multi-galactic uh, uh, company for rare minerals and the story is all set against that. So in, in a way that idea is, is there and lots of people online have, have been disabled people but they can ha have a different identity uh, on dating sites and all sorts of things. But it's also something that can be used to to give more freedom to people uh, who are, if you like, 
severely in, impaired in their functions because of their health or because of a, a long term impairment. Uh, the, and I think that we could explore that a lot more about how this could be utilised in, in, in the and the, some maybe some moral -ish, moral code that we could develop as part of this of the do's and don'ts of using this, it, you know, which I think would be quite useful. I hinted at earlier on because I think, uh, as we know, the internet experience is a, is in many ways a quite a negative thing, which is, has unleashed all the unsayable things and has led to, for instance, the ascent of more and more uh, undemocratic right wing leaders through use of racism and, and other things. Uh, Trump being a, a good example, who only exists because of this media in many ways. Uh, so I think we you know, we need to tread carefully and maybe put link what Paul said with a philosophical background into some sort of moral code that we should, I'm not saying being prescriptive, but pointing out the warning problems of some of it, I think would be what I would say we should be looking at. Mm -hmm. we, Thank we're you, a little that's bit... helpful to think about. <laughs> It would really would be. I'm, I'm just conscious we're running a little bit over time on our program, <laughs> and I want to keep this. To, and and we we're going to have a break. Uh, we're, we're running about ten minutes behind, I think. So, but I still want, still want to have an opportunity for a break. Maybe we could just have a five, a quick five five minute break, and then come back. Would that be would, would that be okay with everybody? Do people need a break? Does anyone want a break? Otherwise, I'd suggest go straight on. Till... <laughs> Entirely up to you. But is there a, a view? Anyone want to break? Happy to carry on, Jamie. You're you're next. So so, do, are you happy to go straight on, or did you like like a little break beforehand? Um, I'm really be happy to go straight on. Um, just checking though about what time this indicates the lunch break will be, just yeah. so that I can make sure that I've got care stuff. Of course. Timing has worked out right. Of course. Well, we were planning to finish at t 10, 10 to 1. We might, if we start now, we might finish about 1 o'clock. Would that be okay? Yeah, that sounds, yeah, 10 to 1, 1 o'clock. Both sound okay. fine. I just Perfect. wanted to In kind of that, be aware. Yeah, of course. In that case, why don't we carry straight on so so we can all, we can make sure we, we don't finish any later than 1 o'clock for lunch. Yeah. Fantastic. Jamie, I'm going to do yeah. some changing rounds of, of, of seats and screens so bear with me while i bring i'm going to put you into the um speaker's seat if that's okay yep i'm just working out how to get my slides to do I, I'm what i need them don't to worry. do i'm going to control your slides for you you can just tell me next and that's oh, brilliant. okay so don't worry about that's that. a lot easier then fine um, don't, don't worry cool uh, let me just find out where you are yeah long list of people here we are Jamie, I'll put you there. I'm going to take, take, I'll take Richard out for the moment. And I'm going to put the slides up on the screen. Um, let me just bring up the slides. Fantastic. Jamie, I will go, I can go to full screen as well. So I can go to full screen. Then I, then I know you've got some, some clips and videos. We're losing the left side of the screen, Paul. Are you? That's a screen. Yeah, or mine that we are. I don't know if you can recenter it. I yeah, think it's I... dependent on your own. Is it? Oh, it's the size just of your me, own is window. It? Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry if, about if, it. If you can drag it out bigger, you should be able to see have, it. Do you have a win do you have like a window open like participants or chat? next to yeah. you on your screen if you close that window probably 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 that's that's covering it up maybe is that okay uh, oh, that's fixed it for me has it yeah if you just close any any window you have open like participants or chat or something and it should show you the whole screen i'm i'm actually spotlighting my screen because when i share screens i share a video feed it, the quality is not is not as good as spotlighting it which is why i thought i'd share it back to you is that okay yeah. So if we open the chat at the end, and then we can we can use the chat afterwards. So just close any windows you have, and any sort of boxes on the right hand side. Paul, also if you've got a view, yeah, option, yeah, that's done it. Then speaker view is better than gallery view. Oh, okay. Thank you, Tom. Great. Great. So uh, over to you, Jamie. Please just let me know when you want the next slide, and I'll go full screen when you want to. Shall do. Um, I was just sort of. I wanted to begin with the kind of observation that I think is going to be quite 
important during the disability arts element of this project that maybe hasn't been in the same way during it, previous iterations of the bizarreness of seeing myself seated in something other than a wheelchair and how strange it is to look at that version of myself quite frankly in a way I'm mostly finding very amusing but that I think one of the interesting things about this technology then is going to be the ways in which it can change the disabled body visually and that thinking about it and thinking about things like mirror box therapy which is used to help with phantom pain post amputation where people look in a mirror and can see the leg that they lost as if it was still there and that there's something very interesting about this technology as prosthetic but also as how it can change the person and their relationship to their body and their their environment and their movement that I think is just worth worth con worth having in mind as a concept that's not where I was planning to start with this, but it felt like an important reflection when I looked at my screen and saw myself in a way I haven't been in a very long time. Um, but my the actual point of this really was for me to talk a bit about Cryptic and why we got involved, a bit about our past work and some of our past engagement with various forms of digital and groping towards interactive digital work and sort of the point that we've reached with that now. Um, so if we could go to, I guess, my first and then my second slide, because actually I've talked through the first one already. Um, I thought it would be useful to begin with our background. So I set Cryptic up in 2019 as a one off pit party at the Barbican Centre. I had been writing poetry for a number of years. I'd performed poetry there a couple of times and they invited me in 2018 to do a open lab development to develop my solo show, which I did. Um, and then I said to them, and I will add that I had never put on a play, organized an event, or indeed had a job that I, why not let me curate a lineup of deaf and disabled artists? They said yes but make your show half of it. And that's really where Cryptic began. And it kind of began there because I realised that I couldn't have done the R&D and development in many other theatres just because of the level of access barrier and that I needed spaces that were really willing to make huge adjustments, but that if I needed them, then other people would need them as well. And that's where Cryptic came from. The idea that if I'm trying to create these spaces that I should be creating them for other people. So we put on the play first at the Lyric Hammersmith and then six months later at the Barbican alongside the first Cryptic Showcase. And then after that we kind of continued running a big showcase every year or two depending, becoming an organisation in 2021, but also looking at development and again, it was because I couldn't find development programs that gave me what I needed. So I thought, fine, I'm going to create them for other people instead. Um, now we handle pretty big, I'd say like probably two to three hundred thousand pounds of budget in a year, which after given that we became an organization in 2021 has meant that there's been a really steep learning curve for us. And one of the things that I've certainly found exciting, and I think Caitlin, who has been with Cryptic almost from the beginning, barring a six month, a six month gap, um, certainly from when we became an organisation, have found both challenging and exciting, is that each project in each year that we do is essentially the biggest we've ever done. We've not reached a point yet where we're doing a stable year, we're keeping on growing and that puts a lot of pressure on our work, but also means that there's a lot of excitement because I, I mean, I would get bored otherwise. I would really get bored otherwise, quite frankly. Um, one of the things that we've been really committed to is work being online. So almost all of our workshops are online, barring very specific circumstances where they can't be, like a, a 3D model making workshop in a site specific venue. But barring that, our workshops are online, our development programmes are either online or we're paying people's transport and hotels. Our shows, 
it's difficult. We don't live stream because we found that the quality isn't good enough. We'd rather get a really high quality recording and release that a week or two later so that people can actually experience the work in that sense. We found there's more demand for that. But we've also explored the digital form and working in digital ways previously. Um, at the moment, we've got our four development programmes running. We've got a play at home in Manchester. We've got a play coming up at the Barbican this autumn. We've got Camden People's Theatre this spring. We've got the Roundhouse this summer. So we've got uh, a busy schedule, but that gives us lots of places to fit work in. Um, however, I'm also really nervous about this project. It's a really big project. It uses skills that we don't have in house. It stretches things. It asks us to try new things. And I think what I wanted to start with, I guess, if we could go to the next slide, were the things that we're concerned about, the challenges for us. One of them is just the cost of creating really high quality work. And I'm thinking here, by the way, about the challenges of good hybrid work beyond this project, not, not specifically the challenges within this, but the challenges we find with the wider approach. How do we, you know, the budgetary implications of really high quality filming and editing, when that's not expertise, we have at a professional level within our team. The technical knowledge gap, because it's not just the things that we don't know, it's the things we don't even know that we don't know yet. Um, the fact that we've found on every occasion except this week, which has been that the demand for in-person work has been a lot higher than the demand for online work, and that the expressed demand for online work has been a lot higher than the engagement, such that you get a lot of people who say they want to do it, but very few people who actually engage. Interestingly, this week, we're running two workshops, which are in person as part of a site specific project, to which one person turned up to the in person one, and 12 to the online one. So there are differences, but in general, we've really found that the demand for online versions exceeds engagement. And we're trying to work out why that is. And we think one reason it might be is quite simply that uh, is quite simply that there's so much low quality online work out there that the market's a bit saturated with single camera angle, fuzzy mic, here you go, you've got access now as an approach rather than an approach that actually values all ways of joining the piece and isn't creating a piece for one medium that it then gives a poor imitation of for another, but actually creates for multi-mediums. As performer, one of the things that I find very difficult is the timing pressures of pre-structured content that I can't simply, I can't have the cues follow where I am. I have to be in time with anything that's been pre-recorded and preset. Um, and then there's a risk of kind of over preparation and a loss of spontaneity. That if we're not taking an interactive approach, how do you retain the sense of risk that you have in theatre? Because in theatre, the performer's on the precipice where something could go wrong and you have to believe that it won't. But the more pre-structured and pre-designed it is, the lower the stakes for it going wrong feel like they are. Um, I thought I would take you through a few bits of work that we've explored in the past. Um, different ways that we've played with the digital form. Um, I will warn you now that one of the slides includes some nudity. I will explain it at the time. It does have a contextual uh, point. Um, and if we go to the next slide, the first project I wanted to talk about a bit was the Crip Monologues. We well, at one point we thought we would use that for this, but the, there were some problems around safeguarding where we felt that it just wasn't the right project. Um, because the Crypt Monologues is very much about reclaiming the ways in which the visibly disabled body is scrutinised. It came out of my sense that as a electric wheelchair user, people are constantly staring. And yet when I catch them staring, they look away. So with the Crypt Monologues, I pitched it to Camden People's Theatre, said at the end of the pitch, actually, you know, you should probably take someone else instead, um, ended up being taken and had to work it out. And it was a set, and now is a set of monologues performed by naked or nearly naked disabled performers on stage with the challenge to the audience of, this is it. This is the thing that you're constantly staring at. Have it, go on. 
but I'm watching you and I'm staring back at you and you don't like it that much anymore, do you? It's that deliberate desire to play with that discomfort and to reclaim the power of, I guess, that power of visibility as my own rather than as something the audience can can do almost non-consensually. And these had a very strong digital element. You can see here the extent to which captions are projected over my body, that the body becomes part of the screen and part of the performance. Um, there are things here I want to do around ways in which we could combine live and digital formats, but it felt like because of the nudity involved in the pieces, we didn't want to be navigating that with performers in terms of a digital provision as well, where it's already quite a big ask to work in this way. Um, so I've got a clip on the next slide, which shows one of the ways in which we tried to work with live performance. On that slide, I am controlling the computer in front of my face with my eyes by looking at it. You can then see that computer projected into the background. That is something radical in how I am writing this script. It relies on nothing. There is something radical in how I am writing this script. It relies on nothing. Apologies for the quality of the sound. These were clips recorded during the R&D for us to go back and use to reflect on the work. That set me a lot of challenges around timing, around performance, around managing complex and multiple things at once, but was also an approach to captioning that by speaking and typing simultaneously, the captions were being created in a world that was consistent with the piece. So I guess out of the challenges there, there's obvious challenges with the quality of it, but it was also the real timing pressures and some of the knowledge gaps for us about how we would effectively mirror my screen to the screen behind me in a live theatre performance without lag and how we would control for mistakes. Do we pre-record the video so it looks like I'm doing it? Or do we stick with live and risk it going wrong? Um, the next piece that I want to explore a bit is next slide, um, which was my show originally called Not Dying and renamed more recently, Quality of Life is Not a Measurable Outcome after a particularly memorable line in a care assessment. Um, with that, we've combined digital work and live performance in a number of ways. From the begin the first time I put it on at the Barbican Centre, I had either, I, ca I could never remember whether it was so five days before opening night, my chances of surviving the next 48 hours were either 40 or 60%. And the Barbican knew that I was very ill. I was in hospital. My ability to put the show on was tenuous, let's say. And one of the things we did at that point was get a high quality film of it so that if I wasn't there when the show opened, there was still show. And I don't think they'd have taken the work without it. And that's one of the interesting things for me that this project opens up is the idea that the performer could also be prepared to be performing live on stage and then at the last minute be unable to and perform from wherever they were, that it creates that flexibility. And during various rounds of R&D on this, we've worked on different things. Um, the British Sign Language element, um, we're looking at working with this show and the telepresence work now, because we've got the share, we've got, a, we've got it on at the Roundhouse and we feel like we can fit it in better without some of the risks we had with the crypt monologues. Um, and the show already has some digital elements, um, including the way in which we, handled the sense of being in a panopticon and the ways in which decisions can be made about your life without you. Now, in the live version, it, you will see the, in the clip. So what you see in the clip 
it will cut between a Zoom call and the stage. But if you're in the theatre watching this, the Zoom call would be projected behind the stage. So it would be watched as if with the performers made tiny in front of it. So if we go to that next clip. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hale. We appreciate that it was not ideal that you uh, couldn't uh, join us in person, but uh, but yes, we, we we appreciate everything you've you've said and shown us. Then the email came and told me that the wheelchair lift was broken, so I had to submit my evidence by video. As if you couldn't just wait for it to be repaired. As if this wasn't the entire bloody world all the bloody time. And with the show, in clips, we go between me engaging with the audience and me engaging with the panel projected behind. That that turn to look at the back of the stage is a lot more powerful when you see that it's the panel still there, still frozen behind us while I talk. And the idea there was exploring how digital content could really shape the show. And one of the places that I'm keen to trial taking this in future is the concept of audience voting. That there are a series of points at which the audience are invited to vote that helps determine the rest of the play. Will they vote on my side? Or will they vote on the panel's side? Will they accept arguments the panel makes about the fact that they've got a limited amount of money and lots of people? And why should all of that money go to me when there are other people who could need it? And then at the end for the audience to discover that the voting was rigged, that the charts they see on screen showing how much of the audience voted in favour of the panel with this constant narrow but growing majority towards the panel was all falsified. Their votes weren't counted. They went nowhere. They didn't exist. You tap a button, nothing happens. The idea that we play with the ways in which people can be influenced. And one of the things that we also talked about there, particularly with where we'd staged it at the Barbican previously, was the idea of the panel being physically present the entire time, sat perhaps to the side of the stage or on a balcony behind a table taking note, such that when you cut to the scenes with them, the cameras on their faces project them onto a zoom behind the stage, but the people are still there the whole time in their physical bodies simultaneously how do you capture the disabled experience of constantly being observed and how does technology open up ways of doing that one of the next things we worked on thinking about digital in person elements of the show was the timing of the british sign language the show was originally written by me in spoken english and i'm not a fluent bsl signer by any means though i sign a small amount it was translated originally just by whoever was interpreting the performances. And then we commissioned DL Williams, who you saw in the previous clip with me, to do a full translation and for us to work on performing simultaneously in spoken English and British Sign Language. The problem with that is the two very different grammatical structures of the language that we could never be at exactly the same point. The secondary problem is that I needed to look at DL for quite a while to pick out what, where in the show they were signing, and they couldn't hear me in terms of where I was speaking. So there became a series of challenges about keeping in time. I wanted the show to be very scalable, to be anything from toured as a one person solo to the kind of full five performer big stage piece that it can expand to. And so I did a residency with DL, and the residency was really to work on the BSL and spoken English with kind of one of the themes I was exploring in my head is whether we could get the synchronicity, synchronization, that will do, good enough that we could have one performer present in the space, whichever of us it was, and the other performing projected as a video in some way without losing the power of the piece. And for that, we had to get the languages right. And that meant we had to get the BSL and the English in sync. So we took about three days to rewrite about 90 seconds of the show, word by word, syllable by syllable, beat by beat, so that it was reconstructed in both languages 
And the goal of that was to ensure that the visual and the iconic and the emotive signs happened at the same time as the words that they were connected to, so that a non-signer would feel like they were understanding what DL was signing because they could, rec they could hear a word and see the connection between that word and the sign that they saw, really trying to bring DL's presence as a co-performer and in other scenes, you know, we really see DL and I performing together. They're never an interpreter off to the side, but how we could really bring in such tight timing that it both myself and DL became compelling to all audiences rather than there being a sense that DL was there for deaf audiences and I was there for hearing audiences. So if we just watch this next video clip. And the email came and told me that the wheelchair lift was broken. So I had to submit my evidence by video. As if they couldn't just wait for it to be repaired. As if this wasn't the entire bloody world all the bloody time. You know what, darlings, if I were in charge, the wheelchair lifts would be prominent. We'd signpost them, advertise them, talk about them everywhere. We would take their historic buildings and build ramps to the entrance and paint them gold and sparkly and dare them, just dare them to take them away. Oh, fuck those excuses. And there was a huge amount of work and rewriting and restructuring involved in trying to figure out how we could really get the languages landing far more simultaneously and far better for everybody, rather than trying to privilege one mode of communication over another. I guess the goal by the end is for the piece, it not to be clear whether it was written first in spoken English or British Sign Language, because it's delivered equally in both. And that's what working towards with the idea then that it could be that I perform it physically in person and that the BSL is a digital projection, but is so high quality and so well timed that we're able to integrate it anyway, or equally that DL is performing it in BSL and that we've got a lot of the effects which are on my body, the hospital bed, the wings, the manual wheelchair, that the, the, the visuals often take place on me rather than on DL, but that those could be screened and experienced behind DL and then it would simply be delivered firstly in BSL. So that those are the projects that we're working on. And it's a bit cheeky for me to show you the next project because actually I commissioned it, but I didn't make it. Um, it's a writer called Tom Riles and it's performed by a performer called Jodie Mitchell. And the original intention for the piece was that it would be performed live on stage at the Barbican with a camera on Jodie's face, projecting Jodie up onto a template on the backdrop, which was the frame of an Instagram post and comments so that the audience is watching Jodie but could also see Jodie's Instagram feed, the sense of the performer and the performed. As it happened, Jodie was ill and couldn't perform in person. So the entire thing was pre-recorded. And that's something that we've really worked towards in our work is how do you, how do you make sure you're prepared for that? But in the, in the final clip, we get the sense of the Instagram framing, but also a sense of liveness created in the way the video was constructed with fake Instagram comments and reactions coming through. So if we could go to that slide. Now I wanted to figure out what self-care looked like for me and through doing that, what it might look like for other people. It's sort of my experiment. You know, do I need a hot bath or do I need to not spend 50% of my income on rent, which forces me to work a 60-hour week. 
It's a difficult choice, it's hard. And that leads us on to our exercise for the day. You know, I've got a brand new exercise, never before tried. This is the world premiere for you. That's quite exciting, isn't it? So I'm gonna come and pop you down over here. Get us all set up again for the exercise. How's that, am I okay? Yeah, we're good, we're good, we're good. Okay, so I'm gonna grab this, set this up. Basically, I went to yoga training, and by yoga, I don't mean the spiritual practice. I mean, I did movements slowly in a room surrounded by people wearing Lululemon pants. So I guess that piece gives a sense of how liveness can be created even in something pre-recorded, but also gave a sense of what that might have been like had we been able to stage it. And I guess coming to the end of those sort of varied pieces and the challenges they brought us left me with a few questions. And if we go to that last slide, um, one of them was about whether we could develop the technical skills we needed to bridge the financial and knowledge gaps that I talked about, what those skills are, how much work they are to learn, what we actually need to be able to do, what we need to look outside ourselves for. The question about the gap between reported and actual demand for online hybrid and hybrid theatre, uh, market saturation, low quality digital work, or is there just low demand? Like, how do we understand that? Is the only way we can do that to be to create really high quality work and see if there is demand now? Um, question about how you can pre-record and pre-construct content effectively when performance timings are unpredictable. And a question about how to make live theatre feel live when it has that filmic character and whether to fight that or whether to lean into it. So I guess these are our, these are our big questions as we kind of proceed with the project. Um, and that kind of takes me to the end of my planned presentation. Great, thank you, Jamie. I'll join you here. Um, if you just bear with me for a moment. Um, I'm just going to, oh, sorry. I was going to have, um, uh, I was going to bring Trish up actually. I think that's what I was going to do. Um, <laughs> is that all right, Trish? If you'd like yeah, to that's fine. share some questions. I need to check my, there we are, wonderful. And I know, what I just quickly just say, I know we're a little bit over time, but what I'm going to suggest we do is we'll still break for lunch at one and maybe we'll come back after lunch and I'll do my presentation after lunch. It's only very short and that might set us up for the discussion afterwards. So please, so let's just carry, we have a, we have a 10 minutes or five minutes thereabouts now for some questions be just before one o'clock. Um, and there's lots of thoughts provoking stuff that Jamie's talked about. So. I'm sure there'll be a few questions. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. That was really interesting. And it was good to get uh, an insight into your creative process and your dedication to the quality of the work. And I had a question around sort of the the aesthetic of the, 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 the telepresence um, system provides at the moment and how you feel about that and the creative potential within that. I think what I'm really keen to do with regard to that is to start storyboarding what it could be like. So we're going to be probably working with quality of life is not a measurable outcome for this project because we've got the show on for one night at the Roundhouse, um, because we're going to do a big funding grant to accompany that and because it opens up a lot of possibilities for me at the moment. The film of the show could tour internationally but the idea of creating something where i could tour a live show without having to travel also seemed really fascinating um so i guess for me the a lot of my questions are going to be about how how i will end up using it that i've had various ideas that don't quite fit within the project brief unfortunately about the face of the live performer physically in the theater also being the face on the screen behind so that we have that sense of the first i suppose act being set in what on stage is a very abstracted hospital but on the screen behind is a far more either kind of watercolor-esque or 
realistic hospital that allows for that hyper realism to then dissolve into kind of nightmarishness and enhance the storyline that way by projecting a lot of the things that the work is exploring. So I think that's kind of what I'm thinking about at the moment. And then I guess also the longer term aesthetic possibilities of how we can combine that, particularly with British Sign Language, whether the kind of telepresence model with a full body camera rather than a head and shoulders camera would allow my, the deaf performer to be somewhere other than me, but still be performing live and what space we could then put them in that a lot of the time they function in the play as an avatar of me. So can we build the world that they're in around around me? So lots of questions there about how we could use it. I think it's difficult because we get carried away with how we could rather than how we will. And it's about getting the scale right for what we decide eventually to to try because it's a 45 minute show and making sure that we're not asking more of ourselves than capacity allows. Yeah. Good point. Thanks. Can I open it up to others? Who, has anyone else got a question or a comment? I could certainly, as I certainly have got a, <laughs> just a reply comment to that. I mean, I think that um, the, the, the timings and BSLs, that's, that is a, that's a real challenge. And I'm, and I'm, it would be really interesting to have a further discussion on, on that. And, and, and I'm not sure we're going to solve all of that. In this, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. I don't think we will, but I think we might find pointers to where we need to make where others, other researchers, perhaps more um, familiar with even kind of machine learning AI type of technologies that will that will create those kinds of opportunities to 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 to, to um, respond and, and put that put that timing into place so that translate so that translation is real time. But um, I think it could be it could be a challenge for us. But but nevertheless, I think we should have that conversation. Um, I think I don't. Sorry, James, go ahead. I was going to say that's not what we'll be working on. We wouldn't be trying to do that with this project, no. given that it took us three days to get 90 seconds of script in reasonable shape. But that's something that I think this could be really valuable for down the line if we learn the skills in house. Mm. Um, because I've also got some ideas around timing and AI and a program that I use to learn scripts that listens to what I'm saying and catches my mistake and shows me the lines that I'm forgetting. So there are definitely ways of having AI models that know what you're saying and can respond to that. So there'd be ways there of knowing what, where someone was and playing the, the signed performance maybe even slowing it down or speeding it up very very slightly 10% in either direction to fit with changes in pace with the live performance but that is far beyond what we're going to try and do here um yeah that that that's an entire mm. an entirely new project uh, <clears throat> yeah but j just just that one comment on that because um, I didn't I didn't show any of my theatre work, but it, a lot of that is uh, and you've mentioned about having your face on the on the screen behind and so on. Um, but I, I was doing a lot of uh, live theatre work using doubles and doubles of myself and triples of myself and so on. But then it was just about synchronising, which just takes a lot of rehearsal. Um, but equally with the with the signing and it was the, that 90 seconds you show was really effective when it it was working together there's also um the you know a technique of pre-recording um the the the, the BS, bsl and then if you then you have the recording and you're able to time your dialogue in relation to that so then we bring the signer in as a, as a pre-recording within a virtual set you can't you can't kind of tell whether whether it's li live 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 or not and you put, perform with that and i don't think it matters if sometimes you're ahead or behind um, because the the overall effect will be very effective just as that 90 second um, sequence was so that that's one way to look to, to look at it and it's certainly how I, I was doing all all my kind of trick effects uh, in live live theater it was like recording yourself or recording others and then playing a scene with them as if in real time and it was just about rehearsing enough so you so it looked really good you know 
Um, and, and it is, there's a real pleasure principle when it comes off, just as we saw in that in that scene that, that you, you, you show. And I think the kind of the effect on the audience is, wow, this is really um, extraordinary. We did quite a bit of that. We were hampered by the fact that I've got cognitive impairments that affect short term memory, timing and movement. So it's meant that I've never been able to learn something with tight enough, reliable timing for something like that. Um, we looked at ways around it, um, including things like projecting the script behind the audience so they can't see it, but so that at any point you're on stage, you can see it. And when we we're doing the R&D, we did similarly that I could see a projection of DL so I could know where they were without having to turn to look at them. So I think that would probably be the approach we used, that if we had a pre-record of DL, we had a projection that I could see, but the audience couldn't, so that I could always know where I was in sync with them. And that's where me being, that's where me having some BSL is an advantage that it, it helps with that. Um, timing has always been a real challenge we found. Okay, I mean, uh, another way to do it is that we, is if you had the the, the pre-recording of her, and then um, you do a karaoke style uh, that you see um, text. So you're following, you know, as a karaoke, um, you know, word yeah. by word. So that that is your prompt that the audience doesn't see. Anyway, these are all things that in the project we want to to look at. The best way of doing it there are, there are there are lots of way of ways of potentially uh, you know overcoming the issue jane you've had a hand up and i'm conscious it's one o'clock but have you got a quick question or comment it was just a really quick question i mean first just a comment that i really enjoyed the bsl performance and the kind of work of bsl performer as a performer and not a kind of that kind of add-on or interpreter um but i just wondered you said you re we scripted it um, my very very limited understanding of VSL is that as a language it has a different grammar and different word ordering um, and I just wondered if you'd reordered the, the script or that how that had changed the script. So we took a really iterative process with a more direct translation at first we identified which words in spoken English in my original script were the words that we most wanted emphasis to land on and we identified which signs from the BSL version were signs that would be really familiar to an audience so the sign for lift looks like a lift going up you see the ramp gold and silver have very big sparkly finger movements so we identified those signs that would be immediately recognizable as connected to a specific word and the words that were most important to capture emphasis and almost put those puzzle pieces down first and said, right, if we need to both be on this word and this sign at this moment, what do we have to do to the bits of script in between to make sure that we land on the bits that matter together? Um, so rather than trying to be on the same sentence at the same time, we tried to make sure that watching DL would become a visual experience that would give information and structure and shape to the piece, even if you didn't sign. And that for deaf signers, that they were captured rather than getting a translation a few words behind, that all of the important words, the jokes, the moments landed for them at the exact moment they did for a hearing audience. And then we just had to mess around with the grammar and language of everything else to fit it all in in the gaps between those bits that we'd kind of identified and prioritised. So it was almost a sort of a co-rewriting. It was no longer a process of translating my script into BSL. It was a case of how do we now write a script that exists of equal quality and equal emphasis and equal timing and equal audience experience in two languages. And I think to get that show right with the BSL, I would probably want an eight week rehearsal period that was just about the translation into BSL. Thank you. It's a really interesting process. So that really came through when I was watching. 
well. Thank you. Thanks for explaining. I think you can kind of see the difference between the filmed version that had DL and I stood next to each other and then the version with the green screen after we'd worked on it. That in the filmed version, DL was still functionally providing, not through any lack of talent on their part, but through a lack of work on mine, a second rate piece because it was being translated and delivered behind me and wasn't being given with the intention that it should have been given and wasn't from my part that DL did an incredible job with it. This is not about them at all. It's about the fact that fundamentally what I was offering deaf audiences was a translation of a show rather than a show. And what I wanted to be offering was a show of equal, of equal weight and value and excitingness and relevance. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Jamie. I'll come back to Paul. Yeah, I think we just, we, we, we were, we, we're saying we stopped for one, one o'clock for lunch. We're just, it's nearly five past. So, so um, I, I, if you could hold your questions, we'll come back after lunch and, I, and I, it'd be really good. I hope um, there are some things I'm going to be talking about in my presentation that, that answer directly some of the uh, questions and issues that Jamie has raised. Um, so if you wouldn't mind keeping on your cameras, um, but um, stay, keeping everything where it is, have a, have a, but, but for the next hour, we're going to have a pause for, for a lunch and we'll come back. And Steve, you want to, I know it's yeah. late for you. It's very late there in Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I have to apologize. I've also got a very early morning flight, ah, so I need right. to get home, go to bed, and then get up very, very early in the morning because I'm traveling with work. Um, but <clears throat> can I just say it's been an absolutely fantastic um, event, really rich, fun, inspiring uh, presentations. Thank you uh, so, so much. And I really look forward to um, to work, working with, with everyone on this. It's really um, super engaging. I'm, I'm sorry, I've got to, got to leave you now. Not at all. But, but this thank will you very be, much. It will be recorded, so we'll have a recording of it all. So you can just I'll watch. Okay. Sure. I'll see, we'll see you back at two o'clock. Bye all. Okay, let me just find the right slide. Paul, oh, shall I pause the recording now or stop the recording, restart it later? Yes, please, Tom. Yeah. Okay, it's nearly two o'clock, so I'll just uh, move over to here. I'm not sure if everyone's back yet, but um, let's have a quick look and see who's on our in our meeting. <clears throat> so I'll bring you up on screen again. There we are. Great. Everyone's back. Um, although we have one. Who's not back? Oh, there it is. That's Tom. That's what it was. I, I saw a, uh, an empty box there at the top, and I, I couldn't. Unfortunately, I don't have names to tell me who's who's where, <laughs> who's who. But and uh, and Steve, although he's very still, is still with us. That's great. Um, so he's a uh, elder system. So thank you. Um, Jamie, are you back or is your, your screen frozen? I'm not sure Jamie's back yet. Perhaps not. Okay, I don't think Jamie is back yet. I think what happens is in this in this system here, it um, it holds the last image that you had in here. So actually, I can see a kind of frozen shot of you, which is quite useful actually. Um, it means that Steve can go off on his flight and wherever he's going, and, and he can still be here, at least at least very still. Um, so anyway, we're about to, as soon as Jamie's back, we'll get going. I'll try and make my presentation as quick as I can, but, um, cause I'd like to get onto the next bit and, and have some conversation. Um, I know that we've, we've planning to finish at two 30. Um, I think people have, um, people that might have other commitments after that. I'm not sure, but we might, I suspect we might run over and I think Jamie has as well. So we might be tied to that. I'm not sure. Um, I was just looking in the chat earlier on. Trish, did you ask about the recording? I think it's something you mentioned about whether we have a, whether you have access to the recording. You and you, you will indeed. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What I'm doing is I'm recording it. Tom's recording it, and I'm going to be rec I'm recording it as well on my system. So I record it at very high quality. So um, so you'll get a really nice um, finish finish uh, quality high quality piece at the end of it. Great. I've I've recorded it in sections, and I'll edit it together. And um, but uh, hopefully you'll have everything. Everything will be on there. Uh, fingers crossed. Uh, so we're just waiting for Jamie to return. Do you have an update from Jamie, Caitlin? 
do you know if he's is he running to i know he's got some he did say his in the text in, in the chat he mentioned he had to get off somewhere earlier or, or couldn't hang on till the end i've just sent them a message um i know their schedule tends to be pretty packed so sure, might not have sure. much flexibility at the end um oh, they're just typing now oh they've just had to move their car um okay. But no we'll problem. be back very imminently. <laughs> Always important. Uh, good. Okay. Well, thank you for the talk so far. They've been really great to have everyone's talks. And I realise they're all very different. Um, is that Jamie coming in? Tom, could you, could you let Jamie in? I heard the doorbell go. Yeah, it's done. Fantastic. So Jamie, I think that's Jamie. He'll be in. He'll be joining us straight away. Come into this meeting. I believe so. Let me just check on Teams. Ah, Jamie. Hi. Oh, Jamie, you're you're on. That's okay. You're in your you're on your camera on your telephone now. Is that right? Oh, I can't. I tell you what, I can't hear you, Jamie, in this. So I've got to I've got to route you into the system again and just place your audio back into the um because you're on a different input which means I have to bring you in separately. And the way it's done is I can't hear you until I bring you in through my feed. Where are we? Where are we? Um, I'll find you in a moment. Oh, that's strange. Let me try again. Um, Aha, uh -huh. okay, I can see you now. Okay, I've got you in. I'm going to bring you in to the feed. One moment, I need to do a few things to you. Um, and I can play your audio. Can I hear you now, Jamie? Can you just say hello if I can hear you? Hello. Oh, perfect. I can now hear you. Wonderful. Brilliant. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> so, I had to leave for an in-person meeting straight after this. And when okay. I realised that there was a chance that this might overrun, I didn't want to miss the end. So I thought better to get into the car and then continue this from the car than right. have to dash out right before the end. Right. OK. What what I'm going to do is I just want to bring you in in the right back into the into the multi view screen here. Um, so there we are. I've got you in here now. Now you're in there. Wonderful. Um, so Jamie, are you you're free now until two thirty, or do you have what sort of time do you have to do you have to move? Are you are you in a rush to go somewhere else straight straight after um, this? Now that well, so now that I'm driving there while doing this, I can kind of do double duty. So that meeting was due to start at two thirty, but they knew I was always going. They've always knew that they all they always knew that I would be late. Okay. So I guess like three fifteen ish, I would have to disappear uh, okay. roughly, but oh, I right. like I can stretch it out more because I'm doing both traveling and doing this simultaneously. OK, OK. But are you? Are you driving? No. Oh, I'm being you're worried. Being driven. You're being driven. Good. OK, that's right. I just want to clarify that point. First of all, I'm not I'm on. not trying to do this video call <laughs> while literally. <laughs> that, would be, that would be a step too far. I'm not sure we had that on our risk assessment, but never mind. <laughs> Good, good. Okay, that's perfect then. In which case, Jamie, I'm going to I'm going to give my presentation, sort of in <clears throat> in response to your your earlier talk, and I hope there's some things I can pick up on that you you spoke about. Then I'll bring everybody back in for a brief con for a conversation around the the discussions we've had today, but mainly the sort of questions you've raised, the sorts of um, solutions I've sort of uh, muted in 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 the in the presentation and that sort of thing. And we have a general um, open informal conversation. So. Um, I will go straight into my my presentation, um, and hopefully your your network will sustain itself um, through this. So let's just have a quick quick uh, change my screens, my PowerPoint. There we go. So um, ah, sorry, Ooh, that's the wrong place. Of course, always the way. There we are. Um, this is where we want where we want to be. Um, so this is a, just a sort of a recap on some things really, but just to sort of trying to sort of allude to 
to technical solutions and options we might want to consider and you might want to think about in this residency. And then we'll look at some next steps as well. But I just wanted to just remind you, just put, put, put this, this concept a little more clearer. I know I mentioned it earlier on in my talk, but it's, it's a really, for me, it's a really clear concept about how this, how this, all this can work. And it can do this and more. So, but it really is that analogy of the paper, paper theatre that, that we're talking about. Everything is layers and it's about upstage and downstage. So it has, it corresponds in a kind of um, metaphoric or in a, as an analogy with the theatre space, with that kind of upstage, downstage, stage left, stage right, and the wings and, and so on and so on. So the sort of traditional classical, the sort of traditional um, concept of a stage is is really what we're using in in this in this um, particular online project. But of course, that is to be expanded. And we'll come to that in a moment. There's lots more we can do. And that's sort of how, how do we make this hybrid and all the rest of it. But that's what I mentioned earlier on. That's the system we're using. Today, we're using we're going in with Teams, which I appreciate isn't the most comfortable for everyone. And it's a bit clunky technically for us in some situations, unless you have a sort of a license and, you, and maybe there's some hiccups with green screens and so on and so on. But normally we would do it through this WebRTC route and you can connect straight into the, to the um, vMix system and um, through a browser. Um, but there's only limited number of only up to eight people we can have in at any, at any time in that situation. Uh, it turns out we probably would have had enough to do it that way now anyway, but never mind. We are, we've gone through Teams, which was a learn, learning curve for me as well. So um, that's just to remind you. But really this slide is about how this is so different as a concept from that idea that we, we have video conference, that we kind of, we share each other's, we sort of, you look at me and I look at you. Whereas what we're doing is very much about we both go somewhere else to, 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 to look at each other, that third space, that online space, that we, we, we manifest that digital space in a very theatrical form. So some of the examples of these layering techniques, of course, that we've explored before, and we can do all sorts of things with different layers. We can make them slightly transparent so we can have live. This is actually green smoke on a green screen um, that, that is billowing out across this scene and we can make it translucent so it really doesn't feel like it's it's uh, occupying the space we can play around with um with 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 positioning ourselves behind objects that actually merged into the landscape so it appears that that um the the, the one person is pulling the other person's head out of a hole things like that and of course scale there um and you just mentioned earlier on we can use green screen objects, actual tables that are green to position ourselves behind and around. And so there's a real physical three-dimensional experience. It's not a very, it's not that sort of flat me on a screen. It's very much about occupying the space. And that incidentally in the middle is, a, is, a, is an audience member who was brought in um, into the mix in a similar way to the way we're doing this with teams now. But so they, they, they actually brought somebody in to their performance and they had a position where they could uh, they could put this person, this sort of head and shoulders shot appropriately in the in the, in the scene. Um, we can superimpose people. So in this instance, the, the actors wanted to have their faces superimposed to sort of to, to create a kind of hybrid merged virgin version of the two performers. Um, we can mix recorded, pre-recorded material with live material. So the three performers on the right, they are actually playing the characters on the left as well, dressed up as, as a kind of the play. The piece was about a kind of uh, a kind of X factor experience that all goes goes sinisterly wrong and and, and sort of they end up meeting the Illuminati. And <laughs> anyway, they they play the actors recorded on the left, the, the boy band in the orange hats and things. Um, and that's self that's recorded and then they actually performed with that recording of themselves. Um, we can use quite cinematic effects where we create sort of shots like this. This was this was a, this piece was very much a piece of sort of almost like television set approach really. Um, but we're using this a, a mirror in this instance, the mirror of the car as a, as, a, as the vehicle that to sort of trans to sort of communicate through um, which which works very well um, and it was quite a nice nice sort of um, sort of vignette piece they did um, and of course I mentioned earlier on this painting on screen you know, this is actually a live person painting live 
with blue paint or green paint. I can't remember which. But as they painted, they revealed the other character behind it. So that the actor is not only the person speaking in through the window, but the person who's actually painting onto the onto the paper as well. And the backgrounds here are also done under a rostrum camera live. So we have the ca camera input of a rostrum camera. This wasn't recorded. This was all done live. So one person is actually hanging up the washing, making this very hand-drawn um, environment, and the other actor is sitting on on a green on a green screen reading the book. But they sort of they they, they created the background according to what was being spoken by the uh, actor sitting reading the book. And we use, we can use silhouettes, of course. We can silhouette people out to to uh, conceal their identity and they did this particular one was a murder mystery story and they didn't want if this they didn't want to reveal who the murderer was they had to find out so that was part of the thing and then then there's a big reveal and actually audience members also appear in portholes and coming through behind doors as well we had those coming in from a zoom call um so what i want to do now is actually take you to some examples, an example here. I want to show you, I've just set this up just to give you a little bit of a funny experience, just so you, so you kind of get a feel for what I'm talking about, literally. So this is, as I said, we've, we're in the, um, we're in the, 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 the uh, in the, uh, uh, um, rehearsal space at the theatre, at the, um, People's Theatre, uh, Camden People's Theatre, Camden's Camden People's Theatre. And what I've done here is I've literally just put you I put objects in front of you. So um, so Trish is kind of concealed behind the desk there and can peer out and everyone else is kind of, a, if you know, if they sort of moved around, they could, they could then just appear sort of moving in and out from these things. So just to give you an idea, and of course I'm playing with scale. So Tom at the back there is very small, of course, because he's in the background and the rest of us are a bit bigger and I'm down here on the floor. But it's just giving you a bit of an idea for the sorts of people that, you, that, that could be around you, could be uh, interacting in some way. And of course, we can move our our hands. And if they're full body, of course, so the, the whole image of the self could be actually presented on screen here as well. This is just using our head cam. And I can, of course, do things like that. So that's just one example. Another example, of course, if we... Um, uh, is, there, is there a question? Is there, there was a question there. How did you separate the buildings, layers, and objects? Well, all these very straightforward. So I have one photograph um, of of this room, which I actually got offline. It was the um, Camden People's Theatre website where they have all their images of their site. Took that into Photoshop, and then I just literally just in Photoshop, I just cut out the the pillars, the columns, and the um, the, uh, the the counter there that Trish is behind. I cut that out as a separate object. So all these are, are layers, and then. And then the the the, um, the object is the physical thing, and then the, the bit that I cut out, I, I remain remains transparent. If you're familiar with Photoshop, you can actually save a PNG file where part of it is just transparent. There's no there's nothing in it at all. And when you bring it into this program, you can then play it up, play it, put it into the mix, and so the transparent part will just show the part beneath it. It will show through. So literally, we're just we're just layering these layers on top of each other. Like, like uh, in the um, in the paper theatre model, really, but yes, it is. Um, if this particular thing was all built in in Photoshop uh, as, a, as a complete Photoshop file with layers, and I just saved each individual layer out as a PNG file, and then just reassembled them in in this VMix program. So very straightforward, and it's a mix I can do with up to nine, up to ten layers. I can have Thank this you. actually, no problem. So the other one I was going to show you is this one here now this is just another example again we're in we're in camden people's theater now camden people's theater doesn't actually have any trap doors but i've just i've made one if you like so i've actually put myself in a hole here coming out of a hole and i've actually put you in the this this actually shot here this is a photograph to show to show the space um i put you in the audience i put you all you all behind me i guess in this situation but i put you into the audience um no reason why you couldn't be, couldn't be a physical audience in there as well, actually, I guess. Um, we could play around with those sorts of things. So that's those are just some just some examples of how I've mixed mixed you and put you in and brought you into this 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 feed. But let me go back to the um presentation and um because I wanted to just show you just some examples before I go on to the slight next bit. Now this is obviously Camden, this is Camden People's Theatre. Um and I know we might not be looking at this, you might not be looking at this venue 
now, Jamie, but you're familiar with this space um, and, and the physical space. And I wanted to just talk about what we can do in the physical and the virtual space together. So I showed you this diagram at the beginning. I know it is a bit, it's, it looks complicated. It's not that complicated, really. Let me just show you it full screen again. I'll merge it out there. Um, so that's the that's the di that's the space uh, that that's the model we're using today. But this this thing called um, network device interface NDI is now a standard across all um, video audio computer platforms. Um, it's a sort of a, 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 a open source um, protocol. The other thing we can do about we can do with this the great thing we can do is we can also feed that out. So vMix on the right is our is our system for mixing all these things together. That's our vision mixer and, and streaming platform. But we can not, not only can we stream out the video back into Teams, we can send it out simultaneously to screens. Now that that could be anything we want to take out. We have a we have a number of different outputs we can take out to separate individual screens. Um, that could be physically mounted, presented in the space itself. Um, we can, of course, also put in a direct camera feed. We don't have to take in feeds all from from um, from from the uh, Teams meeting. We can come in with a live camera of a live performer in the on stage in the space, um, either on a green screen or not. That, that's up that's up to up to you. Um, but there could be a live performer in, in on the stage, and then there could also be Teams performers coming in. As I say. That can then go out to all sorts of different outputs. Um, and, and NDI is just basically a net, an internet, a network cable. So we just connect a network cable into a hub and we have a hub with all these cables coming out that go all to these separate screens. And then the screens can show the, um, the, uh, 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 the any images you want. So here are some examples, if you like, uh, some mock-ups of what that could look like. If you imagine what I'm trying to talk about. So this is a, a mock-up perhaps of, uh, this is a again Camden People's Theatre stage, but literally we, there could be large or small uh, LCD screens in the space itself. So we could be having images within the space. I think you sort of you mentioned something along these lines earlier on, and I think this. So this is a way we could potentially have the performance, the the, the, the participants who are online present in the physical space, um, and we have a sort of composited. A performance as well online, perhaps. So there we are. We're all we're all in we're all in the picture. There's that one that's funny one of us there, and then Richard's upside down. I can do anything. You know, you can stretch the image. You can. I've I've laid it flat here, of course, but but um, you can do anything we want with them. We can put in backgrounds as well, or have multiple views of different things. We can also use projection. So um, here we are. I managed to put Caitlin in. Uh, as well, without a green screen, you see, you don't need a green screen for this. But you're a back. If you imagine you'd be back projected, you could be online and back projected. I mean, what you're looking at is physically what you can do in the space. That really is. So there's there's, there's a rig above this above this this stage area. Well, a projector could go into the rig and it could project an image down onto the floor, so people could be looking at the floor. You could have, you know, they could you could be having a dialogue given from the floor, or maybe somebody on screen here talking to you um who who is and these actors could be anywhere they don't have to be they, they could be anywhere in the world um you could be having a meeting with them um it raises all sorts of opportunities to think about what so this is hybrid in the sense of uh, focusing now just on the performance in the space but what is it we're bringing in we can then start to think about what is it we send back out to those people? What do they see? And that's a, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question to then think about. What's the composite image that goes back to them? But um, that is really that's 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 what I wanted to say. <laughs> that was my um, the sort of the, the point I wanted to to bring to your attention was that all those things are possible. Um, I think. That was my last slide. Yes. I just wanted to say whilst I'm here as well, I mean, the other thing about hybrid or digital or online is that we're not, we don't have to just think of the performance at the time. We could think about other kinds of activities with social media. Um, maybe there's a, you know, is, is, does the performance exist before the performance starts physically or does it continue online after the physical performance? whether that's through Instagram or through other kinds of uh, social media platforms. How does the story spread 
and and how does it start where does it go perhaps it's an interesting question to think about in terms of those online audiences they don't have to just come and watch it they could they could just get alerts as well to tell them oh hi you ready you ready for the performance next thursday i just want to tell you something before you get there you need to know you know something whatever it might be but um but that's the sort of thing so um let me before I don't want to run out of time because I know we're short on time, but um, let's let's now move to bringing everybody on screen. Here we are, and um, so yeah, um, I can't see if we if we if people want to put up hands, they can. Tom uh, Tom can actually see that on Teams. I can't see because I'm looking at the VMix window, but if some, someone could could or, or Jane maybe Jane could could or someone could just monitor the conversation, the discussion. So. Really, to Jamie, I was going to really put it to you. Really, that's that. <laughs> I'm wondering if there's any thoughts on on some of those sorts of things. I think the thing I'm sitting with is the time intensity of creating a certain quantity of footage and kind of still trying to get my head around how easy or difficult it would be and how I want to apply it and actually thinking about the show that I'm looking at applying it with where we saw for example the zoom panel scene bit integrated with DL and I performing whether I want rather than trying to create something for the full show to be finding moments in the show where that can really be brought in in interesting and unsettling ways. Um, I guess I'm wondering how how long you find that it takes, like what what time like, in terms of the design time and. Mm -hmm. Well, it's um, it previously, and I appreciate the project. This project could be could be slightly slightly let slightly different. Um, in, into the previous projects. I mean, when we did our previous projects, we were completely in lockdown. So everyone had to work online. That was the kind of motivation behind it. That the only way we could actually perform was to be online. And of course we're not now. So we can have that opportunity for hybrid sort of performances. So talking about just the online element, the residencies before had about only had, they had three months and we did 10, 10, 10 sessions with them. Um, so uh, where, uh, those 10 sessions lasted about three hours each session, two to three hours. And then at the end of those 10 sessions, they did a kind of um, a, a 20, 20 minute, 15 minute, maybe 10 or sometimes even five per minute performance um, that came out of that. But we had, so what we did do initially for the initial project was that all the compositing was done here in Brighton. So I was doing all of the compositing and that everyone was giving me the instructions, but I, but we, we, we're really, our aim is to really allow allow you the capacity to do that yourselves within the company. Now, that, how feasible that is, I'm not sure, but you will at least get the resource and at least we can provide the training and support to make that happen, if not for this residency within the future, but hopefully for the residency. Um, in terms of um, visual scenography, digital, the digital scenography, the video recording, um, that was a combination of the companies and myself or company members and partners who brought a lot of those things together. So, uh, so I did a lot, a lot myself. Um, and I didn't, I, I didn't really I didn't want to do that role, but, but it was, but it seemed to be helpful. And in, in some cases, so with, with Improbable, the last group we worked with, they had their own, um, uh, video designer they brought on board and, um, and they were creating all the different images and animations and different things, different elements. So they, they went out and worked with somebody that they've worked with before. And they've done work in theatres and all sorts of other things with the digital, with, with video design. So literally creating um, animations, images, all the scenography elements that they might use in a, in a physical production. But then we started using it here. So they, for those people that, had, that have that access, they, they used it. For those that didn't, I helped and I did some of it for them. So it's really, it's, it's, and we're very open to do it either way. I, I, um, 
I have brought in other illustrators. I, and, and the, um, well, uh, Improbable also had a live illustrator, a different illustrator, who, who came in and did all the backgrounds, those live backgrounds as well. Um, but I don't want that to really, um, if, you, if you have the idea, we can try and develop something. We can try, I've got, I, I have access to a number of um, illustrators myself, uh, illustration students. Um, you may have access to people who may be able to build those, those visuals for you. You may wish to do that yourself. It's really entirely up to you, but we don't want that to, to inhibit, to, to stop you doing anything. Sorry, I've gone on too long and answered your question. <laughs> Does that help? No, that was really way? helpful. Thank you. One of the things I just wanted to, sorry, Richard, I can hear, I can see, I can see you talking, but I can't hear you. Do you want to say something? You're muted. For those of us who are sort of consulting on this and sort of sure. advising, did you construct some more sort of hands-on tutorials that you've already done that you could share with us about it? Because I would, I think to appreciate what's possible it's useful to be able to understand a little more about the process absolutely we on that on our project website so in each in our residences page we have um case studies on each of the residences i, I appreciate mm -hmm. some of them are they're fairly individually they're probably not 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 huge amounts but but altogether mm -hmm. there's a lot lot of material there but um, yeah. we, we have a handbook as well. We put all those case studies into a handbook and they're all available through the yeah. website and, and all the videos okay. are. So I can direct yeah. you towards all of those. Now, they might not answer all your, que all your questions, um, but they should give you a little insight into what, what they were trying to do. And I, that's the other thing I think I really would be really useful. I think, so one of the companies we work with, Sharp Teeth Theatre from Bristol, they brought in their own um, production uh, streaming uh, streaming media producer, and they worked. They they hadn't used this platform before. They'd used a different platform, one called OBS, which is Open Broadcast Studio, very similar. They had used that before, um, but they were familiar with the concept, and they then got the software, and then they produced the whole piece. And I I simply was just watching and advising. The only limitation they had was that was their their computing their their graphics card, um, which did did sort of did sort of start was was exhausted from it all really. But um, anyway, we're giving you the, um, the the computer, so you will have a, you will have all the computing power to do this yourselves. That that that's something that that we are and we are an you know we have the capacity to provide you with um and leave with you um to to use in future for future production so our aim is really that whatever you learn from this is not something you learn and just do for the project but something you can actually use in the future so all these things what other peripheral equipment you might require and use they're all part of this they're all part of what the opportunity will, will, will provide um I was just going to say one more little quick thing before I forget. So, the, so the new version of this software we're using completely now completely incorporates Zoom. So we, although we're using we're using Teams today, and we're going in in a bit of a bit of a kind of a, not a complicated way, but we're having to use two bits of software. Well, the future, the the new release of the uh, Vmix incorporates Zoom, a Zoom functionality within the whole piece. So you, within the whole software, so you can actually do it all within the software. And I imagine if it's anything like the rest of the software, it'll be very, very robustly built, and um, will allow you very easy, very easily to to move those things, and you probably get very good quality and that sort of thing. So that's the new version. So that so in terms of streaming this out. Whatever we do, we can stream out to YouTube, into Zoom meetings, into onto Twitch or whatever other platforms people want to use. Um, it can go multiple platforms. We can stream it out, but um, it can go into Facebook. It can go into any kind of platform we wanted it to. Uh, we're just currently just um, streaming it back into into Teams today. So that's 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 all possible. Um, I think the, the next steps, I think we really, we just, we really just need to get an, a sense of, of what sort of things you might, might want to try and do, Jamie, what sort of things and people you might want to work with. And um, 
and how that how that might 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 further develop um, into the into this piece. And I know that there's some, initially there was going to be the piece at Camden People's Theatre. Now it's looking more like it's going to be at um, what was it going to be? House. Yeah. Roundhouse. Uh, the Roundhouse. Yeah. So there's no reason why we can't similarly be. I mean, we we a week. Um, Tom and myself would be in a position to come and help set up this this setup for you. Of course, there we're not we're not imagining we're going to just send this hardware off to you. We're going to literally would we, we could bring the equipment, uh, help set this up and get this and see how this would work. That is that is the intention. So, but in that we hope you can get then a I think... tutorial. Go ahead, please. Yeah. I guess I think then from my end that the first step really, and this might be worth doing with somebody, with with our director and with someone from your end who really has a slightly more instinctive sense of the capabilities of the systems, just due to more experience and so more kind of imagination with it and start to, I guess, storyboard out what we're trying to do. because. I, I, so that it doesn't become telepresence for the sake of it. I feel like the thing that strikes me is the extent to which you could really emphasise the sense of a panopticon that exists around the idea of somebody trying to live their life against the constant backdrop of care package meetings and cuts, and that that might be a might be the angle that I'm really interested in taking with a lot of the telepresence stuff. Is how can before, how can we move from just faces in squares for the panel meetings in those moments to using the actors playing the panel to really create that sense that the characters can never quite escape its observation. And yeah, I think for me, it's about working out exactly what we're trying to do trying to heighten within the piece, the threads we're pulling at, the, the direction, the reason that we're doing this beyond the fact that it's fun and experimental, but the it, the in, in the, the reason inside the creative work that we're pulling things out in a certain way, and then what can be done to actively achieve that. Hmm. Could you expand, Jamie, on, on your term panel? When you say panel, how do you how do you envisage that? What 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 would that be? So, uh, I would probably have been useful for me to give a bit of a sense of the structure of the show. Hmm. So, okay. the show's been through quite a lot of different lives, in that it was originally very much about me coming to terms with being in a quite a terminal situation, and then about what it meant to start a new treatment and suddenly no longer be in that position, and have to kind of confront getting on with life. But by the time I was next developing it, I was back a lot closer to the first situation. And then by the time I was back with it, I was again back to being on effective treatment. So it's kind of the show shifted as that has shifted. But it went, its initial stage, I guess, was a piece of work about coming to terms with the presence of death. Then the second life it had was about coming to terms with not dying and with what it actually means to live as a disabled person in the world. And then the kind of the third life of it, it has the first, the first third or so is very much structured in this medicalized space. And then the second two thirds in this non-medicalized space. And in that non-medicalized space, we break between the show and the life I'm leading and sections from a decision-making panel that reaches conclude that is the group of people that decide about care funding. So in terms of like I've been kind of at one point they just decided that it was no longer financially sustainable for me to live at home and that was that I was moving into a care home. Mm. And then the pandemic happened and they kind of forgot about me and like so hopefully that will never happen. But the the panel is always present on keeps coming in, cutting in on Zoom and judging the action that is happening on stage. So there's a, I'm trying to think of a good example and the first one comes to mind is a section called Reasons to Shag a Cripple, which is very like 
bold, out there, fun, DL and I really performing together, uh, quite quite mocking, but in a fun way. And then at the same time, the panel's response is to perceive that as evidence of bad decision making and like inability to measure risk. So you get the sense that however much I've got the life that I'm living on stage, the panel are constantly using that as evidence of whether or not I should be entitled to live independently, etc. So I'm thinking about how we can use this to really bring in that sense that the characters on stage are under that constant threat and under that constant observation and how the, the like the live telepresence of the panel allows for a far more disorientating experience of moving between my reality and you know them sat you know them sat round a table having a cup of tea and talking about me and then them cutting to being on a zoom meeting that i'm also in and then we're cutting to me but we can see them behind me so we can see that they're like nodding shaking their head reacting and how you can create that sense of inescapability sorry if that was a bit rambled no um, no no it makes a lot of sense it's, it's been through this through this meeting that i've started to crystallize what could be what where the best ways of using this in a show that is also very much a show performed physically on stage how it Hmm. I mean, I think I think. Oh, what? What? Are you still there, Jamie? We might have lost you. Oh, Jamie's frozen. <laughs> I think we're just. That's the uh, the consequence of driving whilst on the internet. Is everyone still there? Richard, you're still there, aren't you? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Just, I mean, oh, Jamie, from what Jamie. he said, it's it yeah. sounds to me like it's a sort I... of Big Brother approach from uh, George Orwell that the, the power is always there in the background. Those who have power over you. Yeah, I think it reminds me of the same... yeah the kind of. Sorry, Jamie, go ahead. I was just thinking about the circular prisons with yes. the watchtower in the middle, so yes. you could always be being watched and never know. Yeah. And that is that that's that's an mm -hmm. image that I've always associated strongly with the show, mm -hmm. and I feel like this might be a way of really emphasising and bringing in that sense mm -hmm. that that observation that I can't actually escape, even if I think I'm escaping it. Mm. Mm. I, in some ways, I think the focus of this could be the the, spa, the physical theatre space, and I think we, the, we, that's what you want to resolve first of all. I mean, I mean, I think you talked about you, in your pieces you've shown, and I've seen you sent me very early on. You sent me a clip of that piece, the piece you mentioned earlier on. I saw a clip of it on a YouTube clip, but also in the piece that you showed today, you sort of had that sort of breakaway shot of the kind of um, lo the sort of local councillor answering your email you know that 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 chap who said i'm very sorry it's, it's unfortunate you can't be here today mr hale so on and so on but so it's that so I, what i imagine is these characters and i saw it earlier on in the kind of medical uh, uh consultants and clinicians who who sort of meet you and give give this kind of line that doesn't that that, that is kind of so separate also and, and it doesn't really there's, there's, there's a loss of communication in this in this in this this exchange almost, but that's what. But they they're, they're kind of present on either on a Teams call or a video call, or a kind of some kind of video call. But I think it'd be quite interesting to explore how you might. I mean, might to think about it. What how that could be expanded out. What that looks like as a kind of almost a. How do you make that flat screen into a three dimensional screen? I'm not suggesting it should be a mock up of a stage. It doesn't have to be. But it could be. How does it feel? Does a sudden is there a screen that suddenly just comes on that's, that that the audience can't see, and it's suddenly this person is there, and then they're not there, or they're gone? Or they, I mean, there's things like that we can play with, just with with where, how how physically, how these people are brought into a kind of presence in in this sort of the, theatrical space, and that equally could be then manifested in some form on, on like for an online audience. There's another kind of um, Experience. They they could even be, they're kind of almost like an audience. Like, like, like they could even be in the audience, I guess. <laughs> they're suddenly in your. That would be space. an interesting concept. Having the if it could be done, having so the panel is played by four people, um, mm. all of whom have quite different and distinct personalities, um, and one interesting approach might be to seat 
live performers for those four panelists in the audience with the camera feeds trained on them so that when they're on the zoom call with me in the assessment meetings communicating we see them projected behind me but they are also sitting in the audience and then at other yeah. points we could see them sat at points where they're talking about me as if i'm not there and we could have the same people sat on chairs at a table as if, if the table was just the other side of the stage almost an audition table where they're watching me but it's behind me and i've got no no idea about it but the idea that whenever the whatever the panel aren't visible in the theater in on the screens in the theater space whenever they're not being projected up the actors are still sat in the audience and then there's just this constant inescapability and i think that would also play interestingly with the idea i had down the line for that falsified voting because it mm. it puts the audience into a position of complicity mm. yeah i mean it would be also th useful to think about how this might be in an online sense how people might access this who couldn't normally get get to the theater as well just to sort of add another element of, of who's online and who you bring who you bring in online i mean what if what if that person couldn't get to the theatre that, that that you could only bring them in online? I guess is a, a sort of. A... And that's what we did with the previous panel things. So it right, was all right. that was all recorded online, um, and so there would be no need for them to be present in the theatre. It would only be that as a theatrical device for enhancing that sense of constant scrutiny. Mm -hmm. I wonder. If I don't know if this may not Please. fit in with the way you work, but at the beginning or somewhere to have some real, you know, yours is a real life case, but other cases where there have been outcomes which have been detrimental to the people, maybe having a number of those up beforehand or something. So it puts it in a wider context and it's not just your your journey, but that this is a generalised problem that disabled people face, I think might be quite useful. That's very much a device we use in the piece. Um, right. You know, there's a the, there's sort of a section where um, in McDonald versus the Royal Borough of Westminster, it, mm. it outlines a court case. Mm. Uh, very, very it, just in a couple of lines, but around whether needing assistance to go to the toilet yeah, yeah. entitled somebody to care overnight. Mm. Mm. So yeah. there is that like there's a very deliberate kind of. OK contextualizing mm. because I'm not a, a lot of the lines from the panel are drawn either from meetings I've been in documents about me meetings friends have been in it's very like it's very deliberately mm. constructed as in an attempt not to exceptionalize mm. the narrative of the piece right. but almost to emphasise how mundane it is, you get the sense that the panel have just got a long series of these meetings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's you know, in the interest of other care users and their their budgets and the funding mm -hmm. for their care. It's it's so yeah, you it's really designed to give you a sense of like the scale of the machine versus the scale of one individual. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think bringing in those real life cases. And the ideas of them might work quite interestingly. Um, even also as things like if we've got if we've got projected footage in which the panel are sat round a table reading a newspaper, what's on the cover of the newspaper? Mm. How do we kind of naturalistically bring that in? Mm. Yeah. But then alongside that comes the challenge of what we audio describe and what we don't because the show has audio description embedded into the script and the soundtrack such that there isn't a separate audio description script the idea is that the soundtrack and the script and the noises of movement on the stage etc combine to give you that so if we're adding in that extra visual element with increasing complexity we would then need to think about how to balance that Brilliant. 
Well, that, that sort of c could also go back to the point I was making earlier on about what, what happens before a performance starts and what happens after it. So maybe there are, you know, if, as people um, register, sign up to watch something, mm. they're, they're, they're kind of already uh, subscribing to something. Mm. They're already, they're already mm. ent entering the theatre, really, although they're not. But online they could be. So what is it they start to receive before they actually get to... to um, to the actual theatre venue itself, maybe they've already they're already in a dialogue, already receiving things. Um, so there's all sorts of ways of, yeah, building up yeah. that sort of transmedia approach. And this, I mean, it obviously has big implications beyond this for sort of theatre and education. That you know, using this recorded to stimulate students to look at these issues, which they have to do, whether it be on a social work course or something else, it might be, you know, there might be an extension there. Mm. Just, I'm just thinking, maybe. I mean, I know that um, London Met run a social work course, which isn't far from you, up on Holloway Road. Maybe we could have a an audience session with their reactions to seeing this piece as an extension. I mean, I'm not saying you had to do more, but if it was recorded, it, we could then get their reactions as well and sort of build it up like a snowball, really. That could be really interesting. I've used bits from it for medical <coughs> student education mm -hmm. previously. Mm -hmm. um, up at Newcastle or Durham, one mm -hmm. of the two, mm -hmm. because it was in the context of exploring managed risk. Right. So I think, yeah, I think, and I mean, also there's a, there's an autoethnographic exploration of a section of it in a book on um, sex and young people with life limiting conditions, mm. where I unpack the reasons to shag a cripple section. I think it, for me, as a show, I think it does have a lot of, mm. The goal is both to give it that entertainment interest for an audience, but also that there is an educational utility yes. into it yes. for the kinds of people that are going to end up being decision makers, mm. because it's a very, yeah. So I definitely think that there's, that that's always been an element of it has been, mm. how can it, how can it have that effect by changing outcomes for other people for the future? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a thought, um, Jamie and Paul. Uh, whereas before everything we've done has been for uh, an online audience, um, it's really interesting trying to get this mix for a theatre because obviously what we put onto any screens at the back could have just been a video recording, not nothing to do with the mix, nothing to do with this interaction. Mm. So, it's it's finding elements that uh, and can, would actually see that this is a live mm. interaction with people in different places, even bringing that into the theatre. So whether the audience gets involved in asking questions and one of the panellists answers the question, you know, so that it's like, oh, that wasn't a video after all. I am mm. talking mm. to this person on the, you know, that's not here. Yeah. That makes sense. And I think, yeah, I think pacing of conversation would help with that. But I also think actually the idea of having some or all of the performers playing the panel seated in the audience, playing their, playing from their seats in the audience, but projected into the space might be a really good way of capturing for people in person that sense of immediacy. And I can think, you know, I think it's some really interesting things you could do with even with costuming that you've got mm -hmm. these four people who are scattered in the audience in quite a small space all in suits why mm -hmm. like why do they look different why are they in suits mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think that that that's that's right and i think i think what the sort of point that um tom makes is, is isn't it if for instance it's a kind of important one in the sense of how what is what is the experience of, of theatre online? I mean, we are talking about, this, absolutely, we're talking about using these systems to, 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 to capture images and present them on, 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 on video. We're essentially talking about an extended version of, of, of what theatre can do already. 
I think I think the, the innovation perhaps for us, or the, the the what what makes this different, is how the online audience access that. How do they get it? That that it doesn't necessarily have to be a recording, or it, or it questionably it could be equally a recording. What makes it live, and what makes the audience feel as though it's live? And I mean, I know you're quite right. They could just be everything could just be recordings um, if, it's, mm. if it's completely mm. scripted. So what is it that makes? Because that's that's somehow the part of the compelling part of it. I think for for an, for an online audience is to feel like mm. I'm I am going to the theatre. This feels live. It's not well. I could I can just watch this later. I think I think it's record. I think this is a recording. Um, I think it's it's the interaction, isn't it? The, the possibility of interaction into the thing. I like I like the idea of the voting, and you know that that you could do that with your online audience as well as an in situ audience. Hmm. So if you were to do a, a show which invited a, a an invited audience of people who are going to have to make these decisions later in their life as student social workers, student doctors, whatever. That would give you a different sort of interaction than if you just had an ordinary audience coming in. I think yeah. uh, that would be that would be fascinating. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing I'm trying to balance is that we've got the performance towards the end of June mm. that we are putting in a significant arts council application to support that in terms of rehearsal and development ahead of the show that if we get that then that gives us more capacity to bring a wider team in and to make sort of small changes to the piece rather than working with the text we've got at the moment and how can we bring this in but also mm -hmm. that I don't want to overstretch with those with the timelines for that show. I think a different direction that this project could go down and actually one that could also be a fascinating direction would be rather than aiming, rather than looking at that roundhouse show, looking at how can we use the telepresence element to make an interactive challenging educational piece out of this where mm. it's kind of abstracted but I'm aware that with the roundhouse performance there's going to be the necessity to deliver a really high quality show and to not want mm. to overstretch with elements if we don't have the time to rehearse yeah. early where a lot of the interesting elements here could also be yeah that's just something I'm kind of thinking about Okay, I get the get the feeling your journey is about to you're coming to coming to the end of your journey, your car drive. I think, Jamie, or not? Yeah, and I've got to go as well. No, I'm I'm. I think we are yeah, running I out can't of time. Though. Go on. Help this because I'm now not having to leave this meeting and then drive. But okay, 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 okay cool. Yeah, I, I can I, stay a bit longer. But if others need to leave, that also works fine. I think we were going to go until two thirty, and I appreciate that others may may have already made plans for other meetings. So I do I do mm. understand if people need need, need to leave. Um, it would be good. Just maybe we and we've had a long day. We've recorded this, and there's been a lot of useful things that come out of it. It would be maybe we could just spend a few more minutes, Jamie, if if we can. And I appreciate if anyone wants to leave, they can. But just to sort of talk me through a little bit more about, okay, if if this wasn't something at the roundhouse, how would you use the residency um, to create something that that is kind of uh, um, collateral to that, that adds to it, that is something else other than it. That, that is more, more uh, another sort of a sort of another iteration of that of that piece that is online um what might that what might that look like i mean you know in some ways this project is about not being tied to venues and venue budgets and times that's that that's also <laughs> an advantage of the project that actually it's a, i mean of course we need space you need space to do things and people need space and there's logistical stuff so there's other complications but we're not but we kind of control our own timeline a bit on it so yeah i don't know um what would you just could you just expand a little bit on what you were just and i think about? it is something of it is that if we look at the 
roundhouse, then we're looking at something small scale done really well. Mm. And if we're looking at something else, then it's about developing. We can really we can develop something that is more experimental and try things and stretch it a bit further. It's um, it's really yeah, and that probably I mean we want this to, you know, for you to to, to 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 use, you know, this is research. It, it it doesn't this doesn't have to go right, but we want it to, want it to do to learn from things to to do something with it in the future that that, that can be of, of use to you. Um, so the experimental approach is always one is always an attractive one for us as as researchers <laughs> rather than sort of sort of just addition just sort of assisting in doing what you've already planned but for actually to, to push to push that a bit further with what you're doing so of course th th that may be a more attractive option in terms of the um the sort of research opportunity i guess the question then that that i'm left with with that is that in terms of that there would be the obvious need for a space which we could probably source at some point in some way mm. for this. Um, but that beyond that bit, like, I guess is how much we want it to be tied to. We've got a show booked with this partner at this time in which we're doing this mm. versus how much we want it to be tied to. We are using the residency to create something different and exciting that goes beyond beyond bringing telepresence into an existing script and thinks about how we can change and shift the entire piece to fit to, to really to I guess to get maximum benefit from the telepresence elements but without necessarily having we've got a booked performance in this place at this time so much as thinking we will probably find a performance for it when it's done. Mm -hmm. I think that may be maybe the better way to go, and then you have the resource and the tools to do it. But I'm, I'm conscious that we're probably talking. We're, we're, we're now getting moving to a conversation that really we we can we can um, yeah. just pick up again, have a think 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 about what we've been talking about. And I think we need to come we can come back to it on these logistical sort of um, approaches, how best to approach this, and what to get what to get out of it. But I think that. Ultimately, if we can leave you with a project, with a you know, with a concept from this, uh, from all the contributions that have been made today, it's the, the, the equipment and resources and, and knowledge we're we're kind of providing to provide you with the skills to to go out and say in, in a, even in a year's time and say we can use that now. That 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 project we did last year, I know exactly how we can now use it, and it can be used in this way or that way. So that's what we really want, what, want, how we want this to, to sort of impact your, your work and, and benefit you. So, so don't think we have to sort of have to deliver a polished piece of work out of this particular residency, but it is about creating those, just the, those sorts of, those opportunities to build on, on, on skills and knowledge. I think that's a... <laughs> perhaps a good place to end it now. I think everyone, I think people are drop. people are leaving. I think people have to get on. <laughs> Not sure. Richard, you still there? No, Richard had to go. Uh, Jane had to go. No, Jane's still there. Jane yeah. is still there. Trish is still here. Fantastic. All right. Look, I'm, I've, it's been a quite a long day, actually. It feels like a long day now and it's time, probably time for us to sort of, um, just to sort of digest all of this. Um, we've got a really good recording. So let's, let, let's, um, uh, review that. Is there anyone? Have anyone have any last words? Any comments from from Trish? Yeah, Trish, please do go ahead. Yeah, I'm just thinking back to what Jamie was talking about uh, about online ticket sales and um, like where we've got to with this conversation around. Oh, may maybe it's not about the Roundhouse show. Maybe it's about something more experimental. And I am wondering if you have the material from that show. So maybe it's about a representation of that show for online audiences that is experimental in this telepresence space, so specifically for an online audience, but also that maybe we can have a separate conversation about how that is marketed and 
how we achieve a more kind of successful online audience for that as well. So it could be like a representation of that show specifically for online using the telepresence technology. Oh, I think Jamie, you might, be, you might be on mute. I would really love to do that. I'd really love to do that because I think ultimately that the show has kind of ended up serving in person audiences far better with online versions and films and things. And so the idea of exploring this as a as a live version that was targeted at online audiences mm. would also then mean that if a recording of it was being used as a teaching tool in future, the recording would be of a show that was designed to operate on a screen rather than a show that was designed to operate on a theatre with bits of screen. Mm. So I think that might be, and I think also there might then be something about how do you curate and develop an online audience and really create you know what platforms do you use so that the audience can maybe comment are you using like youtube live so that people can write comments as they're watching and communicate with each other how are you kind of is there a way that people who bought tickets can type onto a feed that always appears on the screen so that ev so that that becomes part of the show as well like maybe the maybe there is a strong argument for us aiming for an online angle rather than aiming for a hybrid one and then creating to that with its own exciting brief. Hmm. We we did that in one. Actually, we, we can bring in a bring in a text feed. People can type into chat that can come up on screen. That's quite possible. That, that's possible. We had we we were able to move it from. I can't remember how we did it now, but we did it with Sharp Teeth Theatre. So there is a way to do that, and I'm sure there's more advanced ways now. I think. Um, I, I think we shouldn't try and. I don't know. I don't. It's not the best expression, but we shouldn't try and fit a square peg into a round hole you know it's, it shouldn't it shouldn't necessarily have to be try and make it work we should we should allow it to, to do what it wants to do so i do think to, so don't worry about timings or anything else i think the important thing is that you get a result out of this that is really useful for you going forward and i think trisha's suggestion of using the material that you, you generate from the roundhouse and other performances as a kind of point of, of departure for this is a, is a really good really good idea and there might be stuff along the way so we, we can start working we we've given ourselves four or five months but we've got there's, there's some flexibility on that you know don't don't feel too restricted by our timeline i mean frankly i don't because if surgery happens then that throws everyone's timelines up anyway I know, so I know you've got that coming I'm up, very right? much, if it, if it happens, which is still up in the air, but it does mean that I do feel a sense of that we've got a good timeline to work to, but also that I don't feel like the timeline risks the creative work, if that makes sense. No. That the timeline is a valuable structure to help shape it, but also no. that I don't, yeah, I don't feel like the creative work is threatened by the limited time. Sure, sure. Don't worry, Jamie, we've got, I mean, we've done this, we've, we've worked with lots of companies in the past, we, we did a lot of concurrent stuff, we've got 12 months for this project, and, and we'll be, we can work with, with Birds of Paradise Theatre and yourselves at the same time. I think the important thing is we, we, we do, we will get towards the end of the project in November, when we will, when we want to have a kind of symposium event that, that uh, Trish and Colin are very much um, um, involved in and leading on for that, that activity, and we're, we're working together with them with, with uh, Disability Arts Online to really deliver um, some outcomes and some opportunities to share everything that's generated. So the more material, the more interesting stuff that comes out of this, the more discourse we have now and, and, and our opportunity to experiment, the, the better. So um, let's just uh, let's just go with it. And of course, you've got a lot coming on uh, with, with, with this, with the essential surgery. So, so don't don't worry, we'll, we'll work around all those things. Thank you. Right. I feel a lot more energised and excited about the project and a lot less overwhelmed and concerned because I think I felt like the timelines and the technical aspects and the pressure to have something really professional by June for the roundhouse against all of the things that I wanted to or imagined I would have explored if I had the time. I now feel a lot more that I can explore the things I want to to create something rather than feeling 
pressured by kind of research output deadline audience number etc which were yeah yeah scaring me slightly don't worry so thank you that's all right why don't we we can have a follow-up meeting at some point jamie you and i and caitlin and we, we can just have a, just a, just to sort of go through some logistics and dates and times we might want to start looking at meeting up again and having a further let, let you um sort of digest what we've been today and then we'll have a catch-up and, and maybe in a maybe in a week or two i don't know how how you how that would work for you maybe middle, middle of next middle of this month probably towards the end of this month because i'm off all of next week no problem at all let's do that all right well i'm gonna Brilliant. gonna draw the, the the event to a close and say thank you very much to, to everyone um in uh, today for the for the present for your presentations for your participation um it's been a really useful exercise um and and um, great for you to get to see some of the work of cryptic arts and and really great presentations and um thanks again all right i'm going to share this screen and then i'm going to in a neat and tidy way i'm going to um uh sort of close close the the, the event bring this event to a close thank you <laughs>